I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do commissioners want to do council on? Welcome. Thank you. And we've got Charles Kastner on Zoom. Um, are you able to start your video and unmute? So it says I cannot start video because the host has disabled it. Okay, I will work on that right now. Thank well, you. I'll just want to be on that. Um, we got to switch around here. The order. I just sometimes I throw you, I'm going to throw you for a loop, Dan. Okay. Well, this this is good the way it is. It's for fun. Um, so we've got two uh, different sets of minutes to um, approve. We have a motion to approve the minutes from the planning commission meeting. So that we approve the planning commission minutes. So yeah. All in favor? Aye. Carl? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Now we have also the meeting minutes from the joint commission and city council meeting. We have a motion to accept those. And we accept the from the planning, the joint meeting with the planning session, city council dated December 14th. Do you have a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Charles? Aye. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I got the question asking if uh, I can do video, and I can do video or chat, apparently. It's weird. The settings are showing that you should be able to start video. Um, let me just make you co-host and see if that fixes it, Charles. Okay, thank you. Well, we're working on that. Thanks. Um, we have about uh, five minutes for topics from the floor. If you have something in particular you want to do the planning commission that's not on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Um, what is it? Um, it's a copy. I'll tell you in a minute. That's for every person there. Copy of it. Yeah. Um, one of the most famous lines from Henry the Sixth by Shakespeare is, "The first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers." Well, this has never been my feeling towards attorneys until recently. I can understand why this line has resonated for over 430 years. Because lawyers have seemed to be unethical by some of the general public and are willing to say and do anything to achieve their objective. But all of you are required to have ethics on this commission, and I've just handed you the city's ethics guidelines, which apparently some of you are either unaware of or unwilling to follow. This governs all persons who serve the city, including you. <clears throat> Mr. Toski deliberately withheld important information from this committee regarding the selection of your new person in violation of this ethics policy. He also attempted to have an ex parte communication with every potential member of the planning commission that was applying, including me. The first thing that he said to me when he spoke to me was, I want power. I want to put someone on this committee that wants power. I told him that if that was his objective, don't select me for this committee because that is not my objective. And that I have found that people who want power have none and usually deserve less. In part, that discussion was why I chose not to participate in the interview process for this committee because I had no interest in working on a committee with such a person. 
from the outcome of your selection, I can only guess what Mr. Kasner answered that question. Having a lawsuit pinning against you and lying to the police is clearly a conflict and a violation of the city code of ethics. Nothing drives that home more than the comments the mayor and council president made regarding the appointment of Mr. Kasner and their vote against him. And for the first time in city history, an appointment that was not unanimous, in itself an ethical problem, especially when one of the councilors didn't even bother to review the relevant information. Then, at your very first meeting, after making your decision, the first action Mr. Kasner did in public was to lie to you yet again. And I stated that his wife had admitted to lying to the police, and Mr. Kasner said that I was lying and denied that statement. If you turn to the packet that I gave you on the very last page of the handout, you will find page three of Mr. Kasner's state, wife's statement with the relevant information highlighted in yellow, starting on line 16. For those of you who do not speak lawyer, I see that I was not translates to I lied to the police. I have not enclosed the entire statement that she wrote, which was mostly fiction, and I'm not in the habit of spreading lies, but if you would like me to copy uh, a, a copy of it, just email me and I'll send you the entire copy of it. This is not the first time that Mr. Kasner have lied to achieve his objective, nor has it, was it his wife's, and it will certainly not be the last as the fact that he again lied to you at your last planning commission meeting. Mr. Kasner knew his wife was lying and knew that I had a copy of her statement saying that she had lied with documentation about it, and yet he continued to lie to you. So not only did he lie, but he was also dumb. So the question for you is, what do you do about two unethical members who have violated the city's guidelines? Do you stick your head in the sand and pretend it will go away? It won't. Mr. Toski and Mr. Kasner, had, if they had an ounce of integrity, they would resign. But if they had an ounce of integrity, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And despite Mr. Toski's false claim that this is just a civil matter, filing a false police report is a crime. It is not a legal discussion about what is an abutment. Like many crimes in the city, it has yet to go unpunished. My lawsuit hopefully will help correct that. Had I not had a videotape of this incident to prove Mr. Kasler's relying, I would be facing jail time. This committee is an advisory to the council. You have no power. Your only power comes from the respect the council places in this committee and in the public process that you provide. If you listen to last Wednesday's council meeting, Mr. Mkoski apologized for his off-the-rails behavior at your Joint City Council Planning Commission meeting. You will probably find that the council, or at least the mayor, probably don't think very much of this committee or Mr. Toski. And while I was glad to hear Mr. Toski's apologize, apology, which was really needed, you can't unring a bell. Your, your decision is how you're going to act, and I hope that you act before two people on your committee allow you allow them to tarnish your commission more than it already has been. Yeah. This is not a uh, little law at uh, that side. The time. Sounds like it's still in progress. Um, so we have for discussion items. I think we have another still. Oh, oh, sorry. That's okay. And I, I see your hand. Yeah, he wants to speak too. Oh, I was waiting for you to get done speaking. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. You don't have more than one copy. Well, I just wanted to uh, make a comment about what Brady was saying. Um, I, I'm oh, Tammy Magra. Okay. Do you need my address? Yeah. Um, I happened to be on the phone with Brittany when that incident went down, and I also happened to review the security footage of that incident. And while they're having their issues, my issue is the integrity as well. And even though you're an advisory group, you do represent the citizens. And for the city to do the best you can with the information that you have to make good, sound 
decisions on behalf of everybody. And I think when someone is in this predicament where they have done something that's not quite, uh, what should we say, forthcoming and truthful, I think that does shine a bad light on your committee. And I also wonder if it makes their decisions, if they were still to, if they're gonna remain on this commission, if the decisions they make are good decisions, sound decisions, the best decisions. Are they gonna make decisions on behalf of the people and the best interests of the people in the city? Or will they make decisions that, that might be for their best interest? So I would just hope, you know, I'm not gonna point fingers or call names or anything like that, but I would hope, because I did, oh, I did send information to the committee regarding this issue before anybody was appointed or voted on. And I would hope that you would read the information that you're given and then maybe rethink it and do a heartfelt decision of whether it's right to have someone on this commission that's, that's not forthright and honest. And I think you do your, yourself a great service to do that. And if you don't, I think you do a disservice to the uh, city and, the, and the, to the people. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, Patrick Berkeley, uh, City Council, former Planning Commission liaison. Uh, one reason I came is uh, until uh, before I knew I wasn't going to be on anymore, I did some homework. I remember that Vice Chair uh, Hubbard at the last meeting had uh, referred some information uh, about uh, funding for possible improvement of bridge. And I talked with Vice Chair afterwards, and we weren't sure what that was all about. So I thought I would make sure to find out. So I talked with John Walsh. Uh, about that, and apparently it goes back to a time where the city had applied for some kind of, I believe, federal funding that would have included looking at the bridge, because right now at the Milton Creek uh, Bridge over Old Portland Road, uh, because uh, it, it's, it's besides the uh, potential uh, contribution to floodplain issues, um, it's just not a good bridge. It's narrow, run into that kind of thing. So I understand that there was... Uh, proposal made to apply for federal funding and but after further discussions it seemed that St. Helens was not going to be competitive for that money so withdrew so it was in the millions of dollars and uh, so that nothing was ever formally considered by the council uh, regarding that development and I just wanted to report back that I had, had found that out. Uh, secondly um, I did receive Ms. Magra's, uh, Ms. Magra's uh, email prior to the meeting. As I had mentioned to Mr. after Mr. Preheim's uh, testimony regarding uh, Mr. Kastner's appointment uh, previously, uh, yeah, I didn't see your email. It did not arrive to me. Why it may have arrived to other council members, I do not know. I did go back and I checked my spam, and there it was. It was in the junk. I looked at it. I brought it out. I'm in the custom of checking my, my email daily. I am a diligent council member. I spend hours looking at all the information that is before me. So um, it's it's just also, uh, you can't, uh, it's poor logic. You cannot argue from the individual to the universal. If something is true in one case, you can't argue that it's true in many cases. And it was implied that perhaps I'm not doing my, my due diligence as council member. I do. Uh, okay. Also, just to clarify, the Planning Commission is not merely advisory. You're not an advisor. You are a uh, commission that has the quasi-judicial and other types of uh, information decision-making. So you don't merely advise us. If I could beg just a few extra seconds. The main reason I came today is I did want to, um, I did want to uh, express my, uh, my thanks uh, to uh, the Planning Commission to the, the former members. Uh, I learned an awful lot about things I don't think I ever really want to know about, but I am glad that I do know. And um, I and I am uh, proud to have been part of the Planning Commission for uh, the last two years, especially as you have uh, made the choice to be more proactive, looking at what the city uh, council uh, code says about what your uh, uh, 
abilities uh, and jurisdiction are, and I'm glad you made that. I know you're still kind of figuring out how that's going to work and, and that type of thing, but I think that's a very positive move. And I look forward to hearing the advisory uh, committee's uh, recommendations regarding HB 3115. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Hey, sorry, I should know my 3115 to the council uh, as we uh, address that issue. I'm also proud to be involved in the fact that we are having established quarterly uh, joint meetings, which I hope will lead to uh, better relations uh, and better understanding between what's uh, what's going on. And I would also say, too, what some of the most uncomfortable decisions I did make was when I did uh, vote to overturn decisions made by the Planning uh, Commission. And I want to assure you, in, in all those instances, it was never just done willy-nilly. And, and very often, I hope, and it, it, it may not be consoling, that each time uh, something was brought before the, uh, the council in, to appeal your decision, a lot of times it was somewhat of a different proposal, and it was a, a better proposal due to the work that you had done. Uh, work that you had done, issues you had raised, so that then the uh, people who had put in for um, applications and stuff came back with uh, better proposals. So there was no, in no way from this counselor just offhand uh, disagreeing or rejecting with you. And, and it was always uh, trying to keep that in mind. Finally, I just want to um, say many, many thanks. You already know uh, what uh, one of the staff you have with uh, Jacob and Jenny and Christina. Um, I, uh, I I have a cold. I'm not, I'm not sure yet. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, but just you you know what it is, and uh, it's going to be a tough budget cycle coming up. I know you will advocate, and I hope that you do advocate with the council and the budget committee for increased funding for planning and deserve it. But um, so I'm also advocating for everybody else to come come forward. And I just really encourage you all to continue to be active participants in that decision once we start looking at the budget. So thank you for allowing me the extra time. And uh, I'm out of here. Uh, <laughs> but I will be checking in. I will be looking at the recording. Yeah, Mark, you're the, the council meeting. Meeting. Good to okay. And I just want to say all those who came forward for um, I talk for the floor. We have, we, I'm not dismissing any of you. We consider what you've got to say. We can continue on with our agenda. Though. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and um, can I make just one brief comment concerning Mr. Preheim's in particular? Um, that's the five minutes. Thank you. Um, I don't. Take the timer. I know that Mr. Kasner may want to respond, and I don't think it's appropriate that he does respond because he is being sued by Mr. Preheim. I am disappointed that Mr. Preheim chose to withdraw his candidacy for the planning commission. I thought he would be a wonderful addition to our commission, and I still believe so, Brady. Uh, your, your keen interest in the politics of the city and your knowledge, I think, will greatly benefit the citizens to participate. Uh, and I encourage you to reconsider getting on this commission or another commission in the future if that should occur. Um, the, the document that we were handed to review, uh, I, I do want to I do want to state that I have seen the video of the incident, and I did see a video of Mr. Preheim um, shove um, uh, Rosemary Kasner. Um, and um, Rosemary Kasner says in this document, when Mr. Preheim shoved me, it caused me immediate and severe pain. I'm a breast cancer survivor and had undergone years -long course, a years-long course of treatment that lasted from 2006 to 2008 and included a double mastectomy and reconstructive surgery. This is the same area Mr. Preheim shoved me and is still very sensitive to pressure as a result of the reconstructive surgery. Mr. Preheim shoved aggravated the area, causing me significant pain. I was shocked that Mr. Preheim would physically accost me in such a manner 
and I called the St. Helens Police Department to report the incident. I explained to the officers as best I could what had occurred to me. At that time, in all the chaos, I thought I had been pushed into a telephone pole. However, after reviewing a video recording of the incident, I see that I was not. This is the document that was submitted to us um, on the record. And I just want to say that there's nothing in that document regarding Mr. Kasner. Um, this is a matter that is currently being uh, prosecuted and handled within the civil courts where there will be due process procedures, cross examines of witnesses, and, and if the matter isn't settled, ultimately a decision by the jury. Um, but I can say that there's nothing in, in these documents at all concerning Mr. Kasner. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that was clear for the record. It seems to me as a, as a commission, we can't, we can't make decisions based on something that hasn't even been tried and convicted and, and in a court of law. It's just words against other people's words. Right, and I just I wanted. Count. Count. I'm not a lawyer, but um, I, and the, my sole purpose was to, you know, here in case the public reviews this tape and they see this accusation and they see something was handed to us. I think that I think it's interesting for the public to hear the circumstances from Rosemary Kasner's point of view, uh, having been shoved in her emotional state and the circumstances of that. And, um, and in addition that nothing submitted on the record here has anything to do with Mr. Kasner. And so, you know, to come in at, and to accuse Mr. Kasner uh, in the way that he was, and for a document to be submitted, wanted the public to be aware of what was submitted. Well, that's all. So the rest for now. Um, Architectural review of Columbia View Park. Yeah. Um, so switching gears. Um, let me get this correct. So we can get on the screen here. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this part up for now. Um, so hopefully everyone has had a chance to look through the design um documents i won't be going through each page in your um memo and design documents but um i'll, I'll cover select pages um so what are we looking at tonight so in um back in 2022 the planning commission reviewed a site development review um for a park expansion in columbia view park you might remember um, and this expansion was part of a larger project, which includes substantial renovations in the park um, that include the Riverwalk, Phase 1, which hopefully you all are aware of. We've had multiple open houses on that. Um, Dan serves on the advisory or the technical advisory committee for that design project. Um, but it also includes uh, a new stage, a uh, dance floor, a covered picnic uh, structure, and new playground equipment. And it's before you tonight again, because permanent exterior architectural changes within the Riverfront District require compliance with our architectural guidelines. Um, and that includes new construction. So specifically um, tonight, we are looking at the guidelines as they relate to the new stage, um, which I am hovering over here, and a new picnic shelter, which is called a pavilion in the design documents um, in this area. Um, and specifically tonight, you're making a recommendation to staff on whether these guidelines comply with these two structures or that these structures comply with the guidelines. Um, and I do have um, Shannon Sims uh, with Mayor Reed on Zoom. Um, so she may chime in. Uh, if there are specific questions about the design that she can better answer. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and tee up um, the project and then kind of see where the discussion goes. And maybe Shannon can answer any questions at that point. Um, so looking at the structure specifically. So 
So I'll talk about all the different structures and then we can go back, um, back through. All right, so this is the new stage structure and um, it's got multiple components that I wanna talk about. Um, the stage itself is approximately 35 by 20. Um, so it's about 700 square feet. Um, it's elevated on the front side about three feet and then on the back side, um, it's graded so that it'll be flush with the back. Um, attached to the stage, there is an approximate 135 square foot storage building. Um, and this storage structure has um, proposed has two doors. There's a push door on this side, and then there's a rolling barn door on this side so that you can get equipment in and out easily um, at the stage. Um, there's also some clear story windows at the top, and then there's a skylight on the roof that lets natural light into that building. Um, this building also houses the irrigation controls, the lighting controls, um, and then it's, it serves as equipment storage for events. Um, and then just below the stage, below these stairs, there's uh, a larger paved uh, dance floor um, that you can see on the site plan and then just a large grassy area for seating. So along the back side of the stage, there's seven rolling stage panels. Um, and you may remember in conversations with um, our design folks that there was an urge to keep the back clear for view of the river for all of the other days that this stage is not hosting events. And so these panels along the back roll um, and they can be tucked behind the storage structure when um, they're not desired for events. Um, one of the benefits of having the sound panels in this open or, or closed position rather is that they help amplify sound, they help block the wind, um, and they can serve as a backdrop uh, for different events. Um, there's also some built-in uh, projector screen panels so we can host like movie nights in the park. That's something we thought about um, these panels, we'll talk about a little bit in uh, more depth about the color scheme. Um, you know, staff has some um, thoughts about this color scheme, um, but once we open it up for discussion, we'll see how the conversation goes. But I think the guidelines have recommended color palettes, and um, those are shown in the corner here. Um, so this is a, a uh, cut out from the design guidelines themselves. Um, and then as far as the materials of the stage itself, um, there are uh, basalt um, veneer along the uh, columns here. So that's kind of shown as the material. You know, there was a strong desire to match the courthouse, which is adjacent to this proposal for consistency. And also, you know, basalt is such a huge part of our town. Um, and so there's also some of this darker um, painted steel, which is intended to kind of match that um, basalt stage foundation. And then the other material used um, is some dug fur. This is in the roof structure itself. Um, this is a glue lamb beam. Um, and then there's just a lot of dug fur um, that you'll see in the roof. And then lastly, the columns themselves of the stage. So these are steel wrapped columns. Um, they're tapered to look a little bit more um, soft than if they were just steel um, beams. They're needed for structural support, obviously. Um, but the, the tapered look you'll see looks familiar to the pavilion, which has also got tapered, wood tapered columns. Um, the other cool thing I think, and you'll see on the side profile, which I'll go to now, is this um, sort of warped like look of the stage. Um, and I think it kind of makes it resemble water. Um, so let me see. So here's kind of the side profile. Um, and then you'll also note on the roof, there's a number of skylights proposed. Um, these were an evolution. Um, there, there used to be a lot more skylights proposed. And then as we got cost estimates back, we kept cutting their use. 
Um, ultimately, the technical advisory committee, based on cost estimates, may just cut the skylights out altogether. Um, they also add maintenance issues. You've got to keep them clean. Um, and with the stage panels rolled in their open position, the stage will be open on three sides and the need for natural light into that area um, may not be that necessary. Um, so it's just a note that those may get removed as we move into um, final construction documents. So moving on to the structure, um, the storage structure, um, or I'm sorry, uh, I'm following my memo here. Um, so, so mainly with the stage, I wanted the discussion to revolve around the proposed uh, scheme for the stage panels themselves and then the siding proposed along the storage building. Um, I think the guidelines are intended for mixed use development in the downtown, so there aren't a lot of um, ways to apply them to this structure aside from the color schemes and the materials used. So I was hoping our conversation would revolve around that. Um, let me talk about the pavilion really quick and then we can open it up for discussion. Um, so this is the pavilion. Um, it's much smaller than the stage. It's about 12 by 22. Um, you'll notice there's some similar warp like shape of the roof. Um, and similar to the roof of the stage, there are um, laminated art glass panels, which serve kind of like skylights proposed. Um, those also may get cut based on cost estimates. You know, the main purposes of, of the structure is to provide shade. Um, and I think it does that without the laminated art glass. Um, and it also increases the cost quite a bit. Um, originally, the roof was entirely made of laminated art glass, and it kind of kept getting pared down to just a few. Um, then you can also see the tapered columns on this structure. Um, so not a lot of guidelines to apply to this structure. It's a pretty simple structure. Um, and then lastly, the wall sign. So Wanna Credit Union has been providing sponsorship for a new stage for the city for, I don't know the specific terms, but it's at least been um, a year. And they were promised that this would be their stage. Um, and so there is a proposed wall sign along the I-beam on the back side of the stage. And this requires a sign permit. Um, it's a pretty simple sign. Um, the letters stick out just slightly. Um, I think we could change those lettering letterings out if, if we needed to in the future, if we got a larger sponsorship um, or the terms of those agreement were met. Um, I don't know the specific terms of their agreement. I just know that this is something we have to do to honor what was arranged. Um, again, not a whole lot to apply the guidelines to here. Um, but I think with that, I, we should just kind of open it up for, for conversation. Um, and is the roof material membrane? What is the actual? It is, yeah. It's a membrane roof structure of the stage, right? the color yeah that's a good question i i want to say it's white but i don't know um shannon do you know the roof color let's see if i can unmute you there we go hi um i believe it's white as well and i can confirm that but um that's what my understanding is that it's white what material did you say the siding panels were so they're uh, aluminum, um, they're phenolic aluminum panels. Did I get that right, Shannon? That's right. It's a cladding system, right? Does the membrane need to be white? Yeah, I don't know. Does the TPO membrane have multiple colors, Shannon? Uh, that is a great question, and I am not certain about that. We have not discussed the color of the roof internally. Good and brown. Gray, brown, and white. Russ is our resident construction guy. Great. <laughs> so, um, he's saying we can get it in gray. I think that's something we could consider. I, I definitely think a muted color is going to match. You can see it standing from the stands. See the roof material standing from the front of the stage. More likely, you'll see the roof material from the elevated picnic pavilion 
that exists today. Um, I don't think you would see it from the ground given its height. Oh, it should be something neutral there. Yeah. yeah, you can. You may see it from the side too. I mean, if you look at these elevations, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 that was what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, except you're quite a bit lower, so I see a white a white roof would stand out quite a bit from the river. I agree. Or up back. Well, aside from the uh, <clears throat> potential to have skylights, what about lighting? So these will have in um, lighting systems. I think there's a photo on this elevation profile for for events specifically. There's this mounting system along that blue lamb beam. Okay. Yeah, that's... Um, so there'll be stage lights that can change okay. according to performances, and then the pavilion itself also has lighting. If you um, have an event or something that you're hosting at night, it'll have um, channel lighting underneath. Kind of a modular system where you can use it as needed. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. All of them will be um, dimmable. You can turn them off. You can turn them on. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So is it felt that the, the amount of lighting available will be able to illuminate the stage? Um, if we're gonna close off the back side to the river, that's gonna be able to illuminate the stage sufficiently. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot of lighting proposed on the stage. Yeah. But you're facing south, yes. Uh, uh so yeah, muting wouldn't go from direction. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, this lighting mounting system is not the only lighting on the stage. That would be for event lights. There's also um like a, a lighting system on, uh, underneath side the roof. Do I have that right, Shannon? That's right. Yeah, there's um recessed lighting attached to the joist under the roof. Um. I'm just looking at what we're calling it linear LED linear lighting uh, that's mounted uh, up in those joists. So the rigging uh, shown in the lower left on this image is just for uh, uh, people who are coming to perform here attaching special show lighting. But then there's day-to-day uh, -day permanent lighting uh, in the in the roof structure and that's controlled. Uh, the controls for that are also inside of the storage. We're stuck on that membrane roof. I'm curious why you chose membrane instead of getting seen metal or something that's more attractive than cost. Yeah, cost. yeah probably cost. It's a pretty large roofing system. You can use anything metal and all that. But we're yeah. seeing from underneath, we're seeing the rafters. Yes. And what else? From underneath. Plywood? What is the sheeting? Yeah, I think the underneath the roof is going to be one of the coolest components of it um, because it's all going to be dug fur. Um, but yeah, I don't know that you can wrap this like curved roof to be metal. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm assuming membrane was chosen because of the curv curvature of the roof, but I'm not certain. So ugly. <laughs> the membrane roofs? Yeah. They can do this. Any metal roof, any any shape. Well, he was a metal guy right there. It, it can be done. It's just the cost. Yeah. Yeah, the cost. Um one thing I am thinking about internally and have had conversations with John Walsh about is this we're really focused. We just saw these stage panels and the design and the color scheme. And so um I think initially our first thought was that it looked really busy and that it might detract from performances to have such a busy looking backdrop. Um, and one of the ways we thought to help reduce the busyness was to not apply the same stage panel design to the storage structure itself. So if you see here, you know, the storage structure doesn't need to have the same design as these rolling stage panels. Um, and so if this just had a simpler, you know, charcoal gray siding, I think it might um, help with that intense background. Does it need to be attached? Storage building need to be attached to the stage? Would there be benefits of not, or where is, whatever is blocking the view is blocking it from the link? Hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you do get benefits of the wind block too by having it so close. Um, it's tucked up so it's blocking a bit of a parking lot. You're not really blocking yeah. a pleasurable view that you're renting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's a, um, we've studied this view pretty extensively because there's been a lot of concerns about exactly what you're raising, any kind of blocking a view of the structure. Um, and if you're sitting in the amphitheater looking towards the stage, um, when the panels are open, you'll be able to look out kind of what you'll see when they're open is sort of the gangway and a little bit of the docks beyond. Um, the view that the storage is blocking is really just of the gangway landing. Um, and also a lot of the utilities that you have over there in that part of the park. Um, so, and the storage structure is relatively small compared to kind of the, uh, you know, almost 270 views that you have when you're sitting in the amphitheater. So where the benefits of having storage associated with the structure and the program, lighting controls, housing for, you know, different things that um, we've talked about uh, seem to outweigh the, the kind of relatively small uh, footprint of the structure. Well, combined structure is moved from almost east, almost east west, yes. slid around more and more, or south for various reasons. So. What about um, loading and unloading of equipment? Mm -hmm. Is the objective that when bands show up, entertainment shows up, it the loading and loading equipment will proceed through that um, that you know outbuilding area and then be loaded onto the stage in that direction. Yeah, and I think a lot of bands have their own equipment, and that happens. That can happen in the county parking lot here. It can just be rolled over. This would be for equipment that the city owns. It would get rolled out from this barn door um, right about here. Alternatively, you can go out the push door and just roll it around the back side as well. You're asking for access for people who've been They typically will use the county parking lot. It's the closest to, I mean, I think that's what's used today. Um, it's the exactly. kind of the closest loading zone. Yeah. yeah. And Jenny, I'll add just that uh, in front of the storage, if you put your mouse in front of the storage building and then drag it left onto the stage, that's flush right there. Um, so if you were to load something from the courthouse parking lot, let's say the panels on the stage were closed, you could still go around the front of the storage and walk right on. Yep. So I, my comment is having gone to a few 13 nights on the river and seen a couple of times where uh, box trucks have been left out on the lawn mm -hmm. um, and, you know, blocking the view of the stage and not looking good, you know, you got this big box truck sitting in the middle of the, essentially the event. And I'm just hoping that this design is gonna facilitate, look, you know, here's where you can come up band, here's where you can load your stuff. It's nice and easy to get your stuff onto the stage. Then you get your truck, you know, in the parking lot or go, that's my- Yeah, there's stage. a lot more obstructions in the park with this design that would prevent that than there are today. Uh, I'm thinking about all of the bollard lighting along this walkway. I'm thinking about this raised um, burn here. I mean, I, I don't think you're going to see any um, unauthorized driving through the park with this design. There's just too many obstructions. But there will be room for them to come up and get their heavy equipment up and, yep. unload, yeah. and unload near the stage. And on, on that token for maintenance, the entire river walk is... Um, meant for um, maintenance vehicles to be able to dri drive on. So this whole, this all these walkways are meant for um, like park vehicles, for example, to be able to maintain the river walk or security purposes or, um, you know, police enforcement. What's the extension out in front of the stage then? Um, so this is the dance floor area. Uh, the other one behind it. It's um, kind of, and it looks like a seven, big seven with the, keep going further there's a there's a second seat wall um behind that so the there's two seat walls one right up at the edge of the stage and then another one set back a little bit um so that's to provide some additional seating closer to the stage and that's in the same style as the current amphitheater seating so the same idea of having a stack stone uh wall with uh turf behind it turf grass yeah, and in red in the 
package, there's a profile of what that stacked stone um, seating would look like. I can pull that up too. So the, so the topography is a little higher to the west than, uh, or is that stacked stone just did it sitting on a level plane? The, the lowest spot is here and here. So the dance floor is a little bit sunken. And in front of the dance floor, that's more sunken than behind that stone sitting wall. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. That's right. The the grade yeah. gradually increases. Yeah. Yeah. Did both you... both of those seat walls closer to the stage are at kind of typical seat wall height. They're about 18 inches each. Um, if you're sitting in the regular amphitheater, you wouldn't see that. You wouldn't see that stone wall be, be level with the. With the yeah, grass. looking from that direction, it would probably just look like grass until you see the dance floor, right? Uh, and what's behind is that grass or is that what... this area? Yeah, yeah, that's all staying long. So that'll just be how it's used. You know, people sit with blankets and chairs and things like that in this area. Flat or will that be terraced? This will all be flat. Yeah, so a gradual grade. Yeah, it gradually slopes down, but uh, it won't be very steep. And then there's a. I'm just kind of going into the. So then this wall is like a seat that will divide the grass from the stage, is that it? Yeah, I mean, would it help if I pulled that profile? Yes, up? please. Okay. okay, let me do that. <clears throat> this is not design related, but has there been any audio studies? Why isn't it design related? Well, I, yeah. Okay, so there's the um, stacked stone wall. And then on the other side, it'll be the dance floor. Is that it? Yeah, I believe this concrete is showing what it. So, this is the seat wall that would be closest to the dance floor. You've got concrete on one side and then at grade um, grass on the other. So, you could sit here with your legs down, um, or you could just be sitting on the grass behind it. Enough that the so, the, so the dance floor is definitely sunken. Yep. Sunk. yep. That's intended to be the lowest spot. Right. Okay. And people access that by going to the south end of the, of the yep. wall. I mean, you could just walk through the grass to get to the stack. Right. You can jump down. What is that? Like a few inches? Yeah. 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 This is the height of. Eight, 18 inches. Yeah. There, so there's a few ways to get to the dance floor. There's a pathway um, that slopes down to it from the, the south. Um, you could just step off over the seat wall if you are able to do that. Or there's um, stairs stepping down to it from the north side. Have there been any examples of such a thing? I mean, I kind of like the idea because if people are dancing, it gives them a chance to kind of sit on the wall if they want to take a quick break and uh, or other people sit around. And, um, are there examples of that kind of use that we've seen in other, other similar designs that they actually use it like that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't, Shannon, I don't know if you guys were pulling or if Steve on the architecture team was pulling from any certain um, stage design. I don't know um, that we had an example from somewhere else. I think we were just observing kind of how you guys are using the space today. Um, you obviously have a need for a dance floor um, and it's, you know, just doing kind of lawn right in front of the stage seemed like it would just get wrecked and muddy <laughs> uh, with a lot of use. And so we wanted to, we didn't want to make the park feel over paved, but we did want to create this zone right in front of the stage that could accommodate what we know is uh, desired use. So we just sort of tried to formalize it in this design um, by extending the paving uh, out in front of that area. And then we kind of contain it by putting the seat wall around it. And I agree with what you said. I think that people will kind of get up and dance and then come perch on the edge. People not interested in dancing will sit further away, either on the grass or up in the amphitheater. Um, and you know, I think the goal here was just to give a lot more room for these events because Today, the stage is so close and the, and the dance floor is so close to the seating. And you, when you have your really big events, you have people pouring all around to the sides and even behind the stage. Um, so this, we thought, really opened it up uh, for a large, so it can handle a large volume of people. 
Um, and then another thing we talked about when we designed the dance floor and that kind of additional seating was if you have a very small event, um, I think we were there one time when there was a uh, dog show happening that was probably, probably about uh, 15 or 20 people were there. Um, then you could have that event here and you know it, you can kind of size down. You can have a more intimate uh, experience with a very small group of people if you want, just kind of within that like where the red box is shown. What's the triangle? Um, is that anything? that I'm not sure why that's printing so heavily that's just a remnant contour from the um where the current gazebo is how big is the um the um the gazebo or whatever you want to call it what's the, the shelter yeah. uh it's 12 by 22 so it's about 264 square feet uh, just from personal experience being at uh, rainy 13 nights on the river and uh, sunny 13 nights on the river. Um, having a shelter is a great idea. Uh, and, and then also, um, you know, a lot of people really need to get out of the sun and the sun moves. And so uh, I'm, you know, if it is less expensive, to, to, you know, I know there's a nice, you know, translucent window is nice above, but I've seen some people really sweating and suffering and actually moving our seats, moving tables to help people. So I think emphasizing the shade aspect of the structure could be beneficial. That's my observation. Yeah, that's my experience too. Um, and I will say we're not touching these big mature trees. Um, these white oaks will remain uh, and still provide the shade. Um, and we're also planting, this is outside architectural guidelines, but we're also planting a few trees closer to the playground to eventually provide um, some shade canopy uh, and then along the playground on the other side here too. Um, so. Before we get too far away from the dance floor, <clears throat> could you pull up the next drawing at the top stage cross section shows that drop down real nicely. Top, keep going. Um, this uh, A2.02 sheet. It's not the right set. Um, sorry, I don't know what order they're in on here. No, A2.02. I think this one might be it. Yeah. Yes. Which one? Um, go up. Stage cross section. Oh, it's a, this one? Yeah, right there. It's up. Okay. Up on the right. Yep. Up, no. Oh, to the right? Yeah, to the right. Because he's all saying. And you can see the dance floor, the first step seating, and then the next step seating. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Through the visualizer that way. Mm -hmm. Also, the figure towards the center that's showing the back of the stage and what the. Yeah, so those panels are double. Those panels are double sided. That's a good point, Jennifer. Um, those sliding panels will have the same design on both sides. Um, and this is kind of the area that they'll um, get popped behind the storage structure when they're uh, open position. My first impression of those panel colors, I, I didn't, I didn't dislike them. They were um, neutral kind of colors. I can see how it's kind of busy. I don't mind them being the same with the storage unit, but um, that would definitely break up that mass. So if it's if it gets to be real bright, I don't know. It'll, it won't be this bright because under the pavilion it'll be a different lighting. Yeah. It won't look exactly the same. Right. There will be shade. I think the continuity looks beautiful, frankly. And uh, um, I'm not, I, I think we're taking a risk if we break it up that, it, you know, I, I think the building itself looks very modern and uh, well, not just artsy. And um, I just like it. I like that. I like that. Uh, that look just that's my opinion. And when the panels are pulled back, which will be most of the time, you still have that nice, uh, the nice wall of storage in it. It was just a plain gray, mm -hmm. and that's all you would have up there would be a, just a plain gray wall. Yeah, it's the only structure we have. And the colors fall into when I was reviewing the architectural guidelines, they do fall into that. I think it's interesting that they're a mix of colors, I don't think it's too busy. If the storage building needs to be there, then I'd rather see it um, the same as the walls. 
when the walls are opening, are they sliding into something to protect them or are they just going to be out for? Um, that's a good question. I, is there a roof overhang alongside the back of that storage structure, Shannon? I believe so. And I think uh, it may be shown in the cross sections. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can find it. I think we've got it, Shannon, on our screen. Um, you can yeah. see that there's also the beam that supports them. Um, yeah, if you go if you go down to number seven on that sheet as well, that's through the storage. Um, or sorry, I guess it's to the left side of the page, Jenny. Yeah, no, it's so staged cross section number seven. That shows a little overhang on the back of the storage. Um, so and and then it also shows you where the beam with the panel rails. So that that is. Uh, those would be protected under that overhang when they are folded up behind the storage. So if um, I'm hearing you guys, you like that the siding extends to the storage structure. Um, we didn't know, it does also extend to the side with the barn door. Do um, you think that that's also a benefit that this um, design scheme is on this wall of the um, storage structure as well. You're, just, you're proposing that the barn door will be made of the same material. Yeah. 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 Number one, just to the right of where you are now, Jenny shows that elevation. Right. No, that's the, uh, yeah, there you go. That's the barn door elevation. My opinion looks artistic and inspirational. So it'll end up being that same uh, covering all the way around that storage unit. Not on this side. So the, well, side, the, with side, the, has... the side with the push door, so towards the courthouse, um, towards the county parking lot, just has that dark gray. But it won't. It's not seen by Yeah, you're, park. you're not going to see it by the amphitheater. You're only going to see it if you're walking in that <laughs> yeah. It's and essentially there, a sort of a service door to that area. If I remember correctly that the barn door was a fairly new addition. Yeah, uh, actually in our last meeting. Person, I think. Yeah. Asking why there's not a lot of storage in there. Yeah, if it was a push door, you would eliminate some of the ability to use this inside for storage. So the barn door solution was sure. out of that. So when you say dark gray, you're referring to the charcoal painted steel. Yep. So it would match the other dark elements on there. Yeah. I mean, from my standpoint, I always get stuck on the <laughs> preservationist side of things. And I like that it's done for, I mean, you're not trying to trick, as I've said before in other meetings, and you're not trying to trick somebody into thinking it's old just because it has to fit within the historic district. So I like that it's done for, a lot of done for use. I love the basalt. I like the painted steel. Um, I would like to see the one sign we talked about either bronze or steel color. I think that should blend in more than be just glaring. Mm -hmm. And this shows kind of the size. But it's it's in the back of the stage, right? Yeah. Back, okay. Inside yeah. Right in the back. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's not on this front blue lamb beam, which is kind of the most prominent front-facing feature. It's alongside the back. So we'll have major spotlights on it. Right. <laughs> I think they should be recognized. I mean, yeah. my office is a city sponsor too and mm. costs a lot of money and I appreciate that they would want the recognition so they deserve it. So I don't have a problem with that. I just think it should be complementary to the structure and not something totally different than anything else on the structure. Right. So, um, as far as that back wall, as long as it slides open when it's not in use, I don't have a problem with it. I guess my only question about the back wall or the panels is the design. Is there any specific reason why that design is, is chosen in terms of the various rectangles okay. and everything? Yeah, it's a good question, Shannon. I don't know if you have um, feedback from the design folks that came up with it. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, we had iterated on this idea a lot 
Um, and what, what you're seeing is actually a simplification over some things that I know Dan has seen in the past as part of the tech reviews. Um, but the goal was to, instead of applying a graphic to the cladding or to the panels, to just kind of, the, the cladding material is modular anyway. Um, and so just sort of use that modularity uh, to create a little bit of variety and create that kind of color shift that you see in the layout that we have right now. Um, so the effort, I think, well, I think also the effect, if you go to your colorized elevation, Jenny. I was just um, Yeah, so there is a need in the sliding panels. They, they sit in a steel frame and you can see that kind of indicated in the elevation. So something that the pattern does is it kind of blurs that a little bit. So instead of it feeling too strong, it kind of gives you some more varied horizontal lines that um, when I sit back and look at it and, you know, there's going to be a little bit of difference in the way the light hits on any side that, you know, if you're, if you're looking straight at the stage, you know, um, those panels when they're closed are going to be a little more in shadow than the, um, than the storage building, but at least it kind of breaks up uh, that kind of big panel piece a little bit. That was, I think, some of the effort in the pattern that you see right now. And the reasoning for the panel in general is for the sound part of it or? Um, and wind. Yeah, we had a lot of concern about wind <clears throat> and, um, and, you know, the river walk pathway is right behind this and, you know, on a on a busy day that could be very active back there. So if there is an event going on, just a little bit of like visual, uh, uh, the ability to make the event the center and the focus um, by pulling those panels was a good thing, but then we didn't, you know, the tech discussed at length, uh, not wanting that to be the condition all the time. So the, the rolling panels were the way to get, you know, 90% of the time when it's open, you can see right through it, it's very transparent. And the view that you're looking at here is when it's desired to be closed for a, for something happening on the stage. Okay, thank you. Are these windows pointed in a direction that then they wouldn't be have like the sun shining it right? Everybody sitting in the amphitheater. I love the window detail. It reminds me like oh, the glare. Yeah, the glare yeah, really. from the clear story. I don't know if that's been looked at specifically. You're asking about reflection off of them, off the glass. Late afternoon, summer sun, <laughs> right angle. Yeah, yeah. they they do face Southwest. Let me check if we have any kind of anti-glare. I'm not sure. Uh, I might need to look into the glazing system and check that. I know that there was, uh, well, yeah, Let me let me look for that. Um, and while she's looking, um, I just want to circle back to the sign. If there's any other comments, I kind of nailed the nail, we'll come back to the stage, but I do have to issue a sign permit. So if there's any recommended changes, that would now be the time to relay them to me about the sign itself. Um, so I can pull that up again. I thought there was a note that said, could either be six old. Different color. I want to say it's seven inches in height too. It's not like a huge, um, it's misleading on the page how big it is. That's seven inches, yeah. Yeah, seven inches by, um, no. you know, not not quite the extent of this I-beam, the back. Um, and the letters, Yeah, it says precision cut bronze or stainless steel letters, three eighths of an inch thick. Um, and here's how they're fastened to that I beam. Um, so I guess, you know, preference on bronze versus bronze. you want bronze? Yeah. yeah. Bronze. Great. Bronze. That's the feedback I was hoping. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the pavilion itself, we haven't really talked about it. What's the capacity of how many people can sit under, under the chair? pavilion? Yeah. Um, well, I know we talked about putting two picnic tables underneath it. Um, I'm trying to think of if you've been to the one in McCormick. That's what I was going to say. Is that, that's about the same size, isn't it? I want to say that's a 12 by 20. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I'm talking about the one on the playground side. 
Um, and this is 12 by 22. So yeah, really similar in size. Not there. Right. Yeah, I'm just kind of going through the yeah. easier items and then we'll come back to the stage yeah. if there's any other feedback. So when I was reviewing the architectural guidelines on the district, um, they discourage um, that thick stucco stuff. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The membrane is very similar to mm -hmm. <laughs> like for a roof. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a like different ball. Uh, yeah, totally different product, but it just, I'm stuck on that membrane roof. I, we give up some glass, can we get a different? Um, it's just like you know, when you build something and you do all this beautiful stuff, and your budget gets tight at the end, yeah. and to me, the roof is like the jewelry on the big part of it. And because it's curved, it's Kind of shows itself a little bit more than right. there's up and out of the way. The pavilion, right? The pavilion will be the same material. I think the pavilion is different. Um, I think you're going to be able to see that roof from the river too. And yeah. I do. The way it faces from that. So here's the pavilion. Did the committee discuss the membrane roof? I don't remember the material of the roof. I love the whole project except yeah. for the roof. <laughs> had there been um had there been other roof material choices before? I think yeah. it's been a membrane roof for a while. We've changed some many things about the roof, like Jenny was saying, the extent of the skylights in it. Mm -hmm. Um and it is uh I I actually I'm not I'm not really certain that you will see it very well from the upper picnic area. It's it's tilted up. <laughs> I'm 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 trying to think through like what is your really your best view of it. Um, I think you'll see the edges of it, but I I don't know that you're actually going to see it very well. Um, you know the people down on the docks are so much lower than this. Um, so I don't think we've I don't think we've spent a lot of time talking about the visibility of it because I I'm actually thinking through it. I don't know that it's going to be very visible. Yeah, what I'm talking about is visibility from the river. You talk to somebody who spends a lot of time on the river, and there's a lot of boats on the river. And uh, when you get across the river towards Sand Island, this is a this is a visible area that blends into the entire waterfront. Um, so I think I really would be against a white roof and, uh, and I think Russ, what was your thought on what would look nice? Standing seam is what he says. It's metal. Yeah, it's, I can picture it. I, I, I mean, it's something that we can bring up at the TAC meeting if it's a possibility, if it's outside our budget, we can just do a billion to get the metal roof on. <laughs> <laughs> we have no shade structure. I'm, I'm really trying to get that shade structure within the budget. I mean, I think that should be a priority um, for all the other days when there aren't events. You're going to want a covered structure. Yeah. With a tree there. Yeah, one tree. Yeah. Um, That's an important tree. It's a little shade. <laughs> what same amount of shade is this really look like? As a, as a backup, since we don't know what that will look like, we can certainly entertain gray as a membrane roof. Um, what's the diff and the cost can we get we don't, it? we don't know that's that's what i'm saying is we don't have our cost estimates for this membrane roof yet either we're getting that in late january um i think uh i think shannon might have a point about the angle of the, of the view i bet you if uh, someone did that a little bit of engineering and showed that angle where could you actually see that thing it may be Washington before you can see the top of that. I don't know. The, the, that angle is pretty pretty shallow. Yeah. And it's pretty high. Yeah. She, she made a good point too from the picnic, the covered or the elevated picnic yeah. area. You're kind of looking at the part of it that's the most elevated as opposed to the side. You might see it more. It's hard to know what that looks like because these elevations are looking straight at it like you're from a drone. So yeah. what do you see from the river walk? Yeah. Yeah. 
right further down along the river walk. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, I just want to reiterate one thing um, on the glass on the storage shed. You know, the sun does set, and it sets in that angle. Uh, and, at, and I think that is a concern. That is the sun going to reflect off yeah. of those glass, and then be blinding people as it goes down. People would be like, "What the heck?" Yeah. Uh, so that might be something to think about. I don't yeah, know. that's a great suggestion. I. I'm looking at the specification for it because I don't think the notes are on the plans um, and I'm not seeing any language around it. So we'll discuss that with our team and make sure that we've got something on there to prevent glare um, because I, I think you're right about the angle. That could be a concern. The thought I thought ahead of that, maybe you could angle the glass, not perpendicular, vertical. I don't know. That's weird, but... <laughs> Like this is never the reflection. Yeah, it's a solidifying structure. Yeah. Um, so I think from I, I'm hearing all of your feedback. I've, I've taken good notes. Um, Shannon's here listening to. Um, we would need a to entertain a motion that would comply based with all these other considerations. Um, unless there's other issues that we can work through. Um, I heard concerns about the roof. Um, I've heard anti-glare on the clear story windows, it's preferred, um, and that the majority of you like the siding as proposed and the sign on any other missing. And then I brought up that potentially saving a few bucks on not having glass on the pavilion would help me create I think shade should be prioritized there. That's okay. Yeah, I think it's feedback outside guidelines for the architectural review part, but definitely hear you. I agree. <laughs> we need a motion to recommend recommend that this meets the architectural guidelines in addition with the addition we have discussed tonight. Yep, I just made the motion. Thank you, Russ. Second. No favor. Aye. Charles. Oh, I heard. I saw him mouth eye, but. I said I. Okay, great. <laughs> and we have the recommendation stronger than we'd like to have. You know, it'd be nice if we don't have white. I mean, I don't think that's a strong enough recommendation on the roof. We have what? Like proposed white, possibly. Yeah, kind of could have a darker color. Have but... the tiered. Yeah, I kind of have your tiered. Like, ideally, it wouldn't be a membrane roof. That's okay. your preference. Secondly, it would be gray or a darker color than white. The, the color choice is exactly the same price. Yeah. Definitely right. not white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we can look into roof alternatives that are not membrane. Right. Okay, I... Good clarification. Thanks. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everyone. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah, the, the 2023 2024 Certified Local Government Sewer Preservation Grant Program. Yay, yeah. So, this is an exciting one. Um, yeah, so the memo talks about this grant program um, and its long history in the city. Um, we've been implementing this since we became a CLG, a Certified Local Government, in 2009. And we have gone through six total grant cycles since then. Um, four cycles were used for um, a pass-through grant program, which gave property owners some money to do historic preservation work on their homes or their businesses. Um, and we have a good website online if you want to look at those past recipients to see. Um, in 2017, 2018, we used it on this building. Um, we retooled all the um, mortar um, on the basalt blocks of this building. Um, and then in 2021 and 2022, we used it on the Bennett building. Um, and that's, both of those were because there were no interests from solicitation. So most recently, I think COVID had an impact when we were soliciting. Not a lot of people had a lot of cash to spend on their building. So I think that's why we got no interest. 
Um, but we had a backup plan. We used it on the Bennett building to um, replace some incorrectly installed <laughs> um, uh, transom windows. And then we also replaced the storefront windows. Um, that was a debacle. Um, I, in its own right. The facial expressions, I, I think you, I think you remember that. Yeah. Right? It was a good thing. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. yes. My process, process wise, no. No. My ultimately. Applying for grants for the 50 Plaza Square is that, that do we have to stick to that starting in, in April? That's such a tight timeline to get three, at least three contractors to come out and bid. Yeah. And I didn't apply for it before it was because I just couldn't get that done. I couldn't get three in that time. Yeah. Um, in that period. So part of it is when the application is due, um, which is February 24th. Um, and then we're in contract in April. So we want to get going quickly. Like to get, we start in March. It, it would be a little tricky because we're not in contract with the state yet. These aren't competitive funds, so it's a little less risky. Like they will give us the money if we apply. Um, but I think it would, I don't know, we've just never done it. Um, That's the only thing I came across before is I had the time yeah, to start the solicitation. I was being so busy, it was hard to get three people to come out. Yeah. How much are the grants? So this year we're going to receive um, between thirteen thousand five hundred and fifteen thousand, and they require a one-to-one -one match. So the property owner will spend between twenty-seven and thirty thousand on a project. Um, and there's specific scoring criteria um, that this body will use to determine whether or not um, to grant somebody the money, um, and then. There's obviously eligible properties. They have to be within our uh, designated historic district. Um, and they also have to be contributing. So it can't be a, a property within the historic district that's not classified as contributing to. It's not completely free money. Yes, there are strings attached. Yep. As with most, most great. Fair enough, fair enough. Fair enough. Need to play. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the past, we used to spread the love more so the total amount was less, um, but some complications because ultimately this comes from the feds. And so they needed something. So now we're kind of focused on one. Yeah, we used to award three or four different recipients, about five grand or so. And then we would have more properties doing more work. Um, what was for what? But they set the bar higher for um, federal review, which takes up to six months potentially. And so it, it was too complicated to do multiple rounds of review. Um, so we just do bigger projects, have one big impact. I have a question on that. Yeah. Um, so the four C's, that building that would qualify potentially? Uh, yes, where the antique cop is? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a contributing building. Three C, two C. Sorry, I'm getting my I'm getting my Facebook mixed up with my uh, get your C's. With my uh, C's mixed up. Uh, be, it's uh, a Pythian building. It would be shocked to come with one. Yep. Is it the red one on the map? So yeah, I just kind of noticed that the paint, I mean, the, the paint's kind of worn off. And we've got that other side of the one other building that's kind of got some old advertising that uh, could be kind of rehabbed, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's a pony sign. Yeah, that's a pony. That's a pony. Oh, okay. Painted for Twilight. Well, I bid on that, so uh, all of that's fake. Yeah, yeah. Um, the dance hall thing too. Good time dancing, and that there's there's yeah, some that's fake. Yeah, oh. that was in the Twilight movie. Uh, What's the story? I know it's deceiving. It does look faded. I think it's intentional. It was faded. It would be mayhem in the Twilight. Whatever the Twilight. I know if you got rid of this, yeah. you know, it would be messing with the whole thing. Yeah, yeah Tina was. No, don't touch it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, okay. I'm asking if there's any questions about this program. Um, if you know property owners who are eligible, invite them to apply, that sort of thing. That's kind of your role uh, is to help us get interest. So would they have to be in the historic district? It has to be. So uh, the second page is your map of your historic district. Got it. 
and they have to be either um, the yellow, which is primary significant, the red, which is secondary significant, um, and I, I think that's it. Yeah, those yeah. are the only two. Those, yeah, those two. Yeah, and it's because uh, it's within the federally recognized historic district and their federal money, so, so that's the connection. Yeah. I think Sue Jones thinking about repainting her house. Uh, it's not. Huh? Uh, so paint alone is not an eligible, um, but if they're doing it as part of another structural thing, like if they're doing siding work, for example, that would be eligible. A, a good example is one of the early ones we had, uh, the Masonic building. If you went, go to the website, look at the before, before and after pictures, it was, it was looking pretty weathered on the outside and it was, um, they weathered or shorted up weather wise and also um, painted it and uh, really enhanced the appearance of. Didn't they do the staircase in the back or something? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that was a later. For a building there, Commissioner Toshki would be good to take over. Uh, change the facade and take the 1960s T111 that's not really allowed in the historic district off the building. That's where. Well, There's no shortage. I can arrange a meeting between you and Ben Sharp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing would be is encouraging the Ditto building, which is the blue building where Venus printing in that blue color. That was a grant, I think. Blue color was a grant? I think Venus has no loud colors in the or encouraged. I want to say Venus painted their building as part of one of the sub grants. Really? I, 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 it sounds familiar. I think they did. What are the, what are the hash marks here? Um, that's the um, Riverfront District sub district. Yeah, it's because it, you have the overlap of the Riverfront District and the Downtown Historic District. So to answer your question, um, I did I didn't see any of these criteria that I want to change. Yeah, so let's let's look at those real quick. Um, so I think the criteria do a good job at trying to prioritize commercial buildings because they have a visual a, a higher visual impact. Um, or features on the front facade, for example. Like if you had a residential home and then you had Bemis, <laughs> you know, you'd probably want to score something in the downtown for as higher. So, so there's some higher points given there. Um, there's points given for, you know, whether or not you think they have the match. So if they provide you a bank statement that shows, yep, I've got the match required, you can award them more points. Um, if you just get a really poorly put together application, like you don't think they're going to complete the project in the timeline, they don't have all the bids, there's ways that you can give them less points. Um, so this has been um, modified over the years. And so it's sort of, um, it's in a way kind of tried and true, but happy to talk about changes. Is there anybody else besides me that is Sorties? I think Sheila and Audrey were kind of. Yeah, Russ has been here a long time now. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, I remember. Um, okay. Can you explain this one? The fourth one down. Priority will be given to a project that has. Really positive influence on other threatened or poorly maintained historic district in the neighborhood. So oh, only one out of one change. point. But, but it's like, yes, change. Yeah. I'm looking so good. You look bad. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> it's a trendsetter. Okay. It is a weird one. A little bit of an off, off topic question, a little bit. Are any of those um, buildings that would be considered really city owned? Are they all are they all occupied? Um, well, we've used these monies on city buildings before. So there are city owned eligible properties, if that's uh, your question. Okay, well, I, I guess what I'm asking is so in the, on the downtown historic, are any of those buildings right now unoccupied, unused facilities like uh Bad Boys Pizza? Oh to be vacant, right? Sure. Yeah. And so just from a from a like an economic standpoint, what could we entice people to come in and mm -hmm. potentially use that? 
Great question. I mean, that's kind of a different, that's kind of off topic, but it's not. It's really not because they have, I think their awnings are an issue and the guidelines specifically talks about awnings. You either got that terrible awning there or that insurance office mm -hmm. where you've got Paul Bearer's awnings on his building, but you have to have a property owner's. <laughs> And that's what I'm getting at. If, if we could get somebody to come in and remind what I understand, the kitchen equipment sellers are probably all outdated because we've been closed for 20 plus years or whatever. But I mean, that's that's to, to bring in somebody, you know, uh, whatever restaurant or what. Sure. And, and so that's that's something that I've been thinking about. Yeah, I mean, the potential that these grants can incentivize work on buildings that are currently vacant. Okay. Um, Look, not just facade type. Yeah, it can't be used for the interior. If that's, can't or can't. It cannot. Yeah, it's exterior. But I mean, if that's the motivation that takes, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna happen. But the 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 visual impact itself doesn't necessarily have to be great. For example, several cycles ago, we did a re-rough projects. That's an important weatherization aspect of the building and it helps preserve it. But that goes back to the scoring. Right. Can the county apply? The county can. And they have. Uh, yeah, I have a question along Mark's line. So we took this, uh, the Fat Boys Pizza building and the removal of those awnings would be something that would potentially qualify. I don't know that removal of the awnings costs anything. And then rehabbing, whatever. I don't know. I'm just curious. That would be an eligible project. I think it's an eligible property. Yeah. Secondary. <laughs> but but uh, obviously, you need a property owner. You can't do it. Oh, right. No, no. Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. 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 The property owner would apply for those funds. Yeah. So the information I'm taking from this meeting will feed into our application, which is due February 24th. Um, so sounds like we're cool with the pass-through program in general. Um, and the, there's not a lot of experience with the scoring criteria, or if there is, it's, it works. Yeah. Um, I did it for the straight order. Yeah, because it was, you kind of look at it and go, how do you At first? Yeah. 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 I think once you have applications in front of you, you start to kind of get it. So what will happen is sometimes I a bad will, application you know, lends to a poor score. So these will not be scored during the meeting. Like I will give you the applications ahead of time and you're expected to score them on your own time and come to the meeting prepared to talk about justifying your scores. And you can certainly change your scoring if you have to hear something different in, in the meeting. Um, but by the end of that meeting, yeah, you have made a decision and then I can notify the property owner if they're successful uh, in July. So um projects that are selected will have until august 31st 2024 to complete the work so there's a nice construction window it doesn't have to be done that summer it can be done the following does the city ahead of does the city only jump in because nobody jumped in or does it, yes. the city had a project in mind they wouldn't be an applicant along with the other applicants um usually the CLG program wants you to have a backup plan. Like if you solicit for property owners, they want to know you're going to spend the money somehow. So it's good that we have eligible properties that we can spend the money on. Um, so we'll go in it with a backup plan. As you're, so as you're, just unclear, as your notification of property owners, you'll notify the county. I'm thinking of the Rose Garden. Oh yeah, every eligible property owner gets a letter saying, we open this grant cycle, here's the information. Um, and so the county would be one. Yeah. Well, maybe lobby. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does help to get a, an individualized call from a member of the scoring committee. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions about the program? Cool. <laughs> Do the chair, vice chair, still like doing again? Yeah. Well, I uh, nominate 
Jim Carey is vice chair, and Steve Dosky is here. You don't have an interest in being chair again. Russ, are you comfortable that Steve has one year experience on the committee? Already? You mean? Yeah. Yeah. So. Like, oh, it's just, you know, there's a year as opposed to others that have more. Oh. Well, uh, if you want me to discuss it, I mean, it's, it's I think, um, we all know what Dan does and it's, he's, he's doing great. And I, I think, um, I would like to see Steve on from the standpoint of bringing more, he's been a very good proponent on getting things going. Um, we may not like the length of his discussions, but I think if he can uh, point the commission into a direction that I haven't seen, I think it's, I think it's time for some change with uh, what we do on the commission and be more planning. And uh, I think he will bring that to us to focus more on the planning aspect of what needs to be done by the planning commission. So that was my speech. Yeah. So I have struggled with this actually since this came out, knowing that it was going to happen today. And I struggled because I consider Steve a good friend of mine. Um, and here's my two concerns. If you have somebody with such a strong personality that you have all the voices heard, that needs to be really important. Um, I like the fact that I think you're um, straightforward enough that if somebody's off topic, that we can keep the meeting moving in an appropriate way. And so I like that part of it. So let's do it my concerns, but I, I can get people with that. I may just say a couple words about my experience watching chair chairman run meetings. I think what makes a good chairman is putting the goal of running a legal fair proceeding above all other ties to the decision. Like you have to you have to run a fair meeting. You may have lawyers in the room. You may have angry citizens in the room. You have your own opinions about things that are going on but you have to put running a fair meeting above all else. And I think that it it is a skill you perfect over time. And I think experience is important when you're a chair. That's just my two cents. Well, and my other concern, and maybe you could clarify that is, um, he's obviously leading the charge for the proactive Planning Commission, do we lose a vote? Um, is he a voting member still, or is he just a tiebreaker? And tiebreaker. It's a tiebreaker. Yeah. Yeah, Chairman Dohani, what as proactive planning commissioners we're trying to accomplish. Can you say that again? The tiebreaker is pretty important. Yeah. No, no, I just I don't want to lose. Rarely happens. I don't think I've ever broken a tie. Have you? Mm -hmm. No, I never have. No, it's something not to really worry about. 14 years I haven't seen it happen yet. <laughs> yeah. Not not letting emotions override and keep your cool is so important. And you know, I've seen public apologies made for emotions overriding. And I, I would worry that the planning commission um, would lose its reputation as being fair. Um, if that happened, even multiple times, one time is enough, right? Um, that's, you know, I'm not the commission, so this is a decision you make, but just, you know, 
Charles, do you have a thought or a comment? No, I mean, I guess my only comment was I understand what uh, Jenny just said and everything, but uh, knowing Steve, uh, the little that I do or the, as much as I do, I think in taking on that role, um, that would not be an issue. I'm not concerned about that, I guess. And, and just to clarify, it's to break a tie vote or when there are not enough concurring votes to meet the minimum number required, and there's a table that talks about that. That doesn't happen that so often either. Right. Really have a quorum. Right. We have to have yeah, it's about you, how many people you have, your quorum, how many people can vote. Yes, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm not advocating for myself, but I, just, I had to reiterate what Jenny said. I, I was on this committee for know, two or three years before I became vice chair just because I wanted to make sure I understood how the how the planning commission worked, how working with the city worked. And um, before I tried to run a meeting. So I think it's important to have experience on the, on the commission. We have a lot of inexperienced people on the, on the commission now. So it's difficult to have very many to choose from. It's three of us, really. So, let's put that out there. I'm willing to continue if if if, if you ask to. All I can say is, if you vote for me to be the chair, I will take all of your comments into consideration, and I can tell you that Mr. Carey's leadership was a tremendous example for me. He would be his style and his patience would be something that I would want to emulate. And I would hope that um, in the event he thought I needed a criticism or uh, guidance, he provided. But I, I can tell you, uh, for a year, I saw how well it could be done. Uh, those are big shoes to fill. And But I feel that. Um, and the board and the style that Mr. Carey, uh, Mr. Carey brought to our commission, even in our most contentious times, to facilitate the discussion. Yes, we uh, need to take bring it to a, a vote. Um, there's a motion on the floor. Was it seconded, Russ? Yeah. Did you second it? Yeah. Okay. All right. I was going to ask for a second to make sure. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Jenny is in here to have a vote. <coughs> concerned about that because she's part of the planning commission. I'm concerned about that too. I think she should have a vote. You could always delay until the next meeting. I think we should to be involved. I think we should. Yes. <clears throat> she hasn't been to a meeting yet, and I think it would be. And she did. Perhaps she's in the ER time. right now with a client. Mm -hmm. Um, so she did have she she had something an emergency come up. So I just don't. I just don't think it's fair to vote on that. The change and she hasn't even been here yet. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I don't have a problem. All right. All right. Okay. So we'll, we'll table that for next next month. Okay. We have a 2022 year-end summary report. On to numbers. Now, we don't really have a presentation on this. It's more just FYI. Um, did a good job. About that same number that we've seen. Yeah, so weird that last year was 73. It sure didn't feel like it. Well, if I'm reading this correctly, um, it appears that the number of permits declined based upon no uh, longer requiring a separate land use permit after uh, 2021. So 
if I'm if I'm reading it correctly, the activity level increased while the permit level declined. Is that accurate? Oh, that's referring to just uh, ADUs. Okay. Yeah, so this auxiliary dwelling unit has a one as a footnote, and it's saying that prior to 2019, um, they were con they were permitted by conditional use permit, and then there was no longer a separate land use application in 2021, just for ADUs. Yeah, yeah. and those that's such a drop in the bucket. But we have over the years we've gotten rid of um, kind of senseless permits. Uh, we used to have type one and type two home occupations. Now we just have type two. We got rid of type one. So if you looked at older ones, you'd see some higher numbers, but generally they're recalibrated um, to eliminate those old permits, unless there's a footnote. Yeah, the footnotes are just so that we're, because they're not all apples to apples, if there's a footnote. Um, yeah, it's you know this is this it shows you the number, but it doesn't show the magnitude um, of something. For example, site design review um, can be as simple as you know a, an addition to a commercial site to uh, a brand new commercial complex. Yeah, and we jumped. We almost doubled site design review um, from six to eleven, and I've definitely felt that. Um, you didn't uh, you didn't demarcate which particular one of these decisions was planning commission decisions, just all planning decisions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this is a planning department. So does it doesn't help us see what kinds of stuff we process necessarily. Yeah, the planning commission does its annual mm -hmm. planning commission yeah, report, place, yeah. and that dictates what you guys did from January to that's, January, that's right. um, and that has its own. Um, stats. This is included in it. Yep. Yeah. It's in it. In it. Very yeah. Yeah. I guess what I was looking for with the, with the question originally was uh, given that the last two years there would, on paper anyway, show a decline. And the sense is that there's more work and more activity mm. for fewer permits. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, the you know, the last couple of years have been pretty tough and and really so this is the first december in many decembers where i wasn't thinking where's this december that we're looking for because it's always a time to catch up and stuff like that and it's been several years in fact back when covid first started i was thinking oh this is this is it this is gonna i hate to say it but this is gonna ruin the economy we're finally gonna have a break um <laughs> And that, I mean, that's that's horrible, but that was a mentality just because it was, and then uh, it didn't stop. It kept going full speed ahead. So we're at this interesting time period, you know, having done this for 21 years, seeing the cycles, um, you know, the potential, the big R word. Um, we could see a slower year and we may have more time to do other things. We kind of have to see. Um, but it was a holiday season that, it finally felt like the holidays. So is there a way to communicate to say others besides the planning commission that based upon these numbers, you're actually as busy or busier than you were before? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to... In other words, if you're looking for additional staffing, that's not going to help you. No, no. Um, and that's, you know, that's why when we talk about um, at our semi-annual reports, we talk about all the stuff going on because it doesn't include projects either. So yeah, this maybe that's something that, that gets added for a view of the overall workload of the of our staff. There's like other problems that just kind of. I mean, it's it's easy if you're anybody else looking at our city council look at this and say, it looks like your workload is down, right? I yeah. Mean, Speaking on Columbia City, have any bearing on this? Um, not to us, because it's, it's the planning department doesn't have to worry yeah, about it. The, the other thing that this um, doesn't do well is every project is a bell curve. And a project isn't done in a year. And over the last, I don't know, couple of years, oh, you know, because really it's 2017 is when it was like when we started drinking out of a fire hose. And, um, you know, they just start stacking. 
Huh. Um, but that stack is slowly decreasing. And so this doesn't measure the impact of a project that begins in one year and how many years it, um, so some of these have that impact. So some of these orders in 2022 were carry orders in 2021, and there will be some in 2023 are in these numbers down here. Yeah. Right? I mean, a, a good example, the eight plex, eight plex connex box um, next to Sixth Street Park. That was something that was before the planning commission in 2017. It was just final this summer. And not, not a big project, um, but the designers were all over the place and just keeping people on task. And these were the conditions we adopted. Why is it going this way? And those things, those things add up. That's, that's challenging to um, qualify. I, I, at the last semi-annual report, you know, thinking about well, how do we how do we convey this stuff, and um, that's why I started talking about burnout week. Well, I mean, it's 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 a metric that I'm aware of, um, and I should say I haven't had one of those in. Um, so, what's the point of number of activities are you seeing over the last two years that you see more of? I should say than you than you have prior. Well, it was it was the magnitude of large projects. A lot of these properties were sleeping giants and they just started popping, popping, popping. So the middle school, um, the Violet's Villa and all that stuff happening. Um, some of the sub, you know, subdivisions are their thing. And, you know, is it a toxic neighborhood or not? And how many people come out and fight it? Um, the apartment project on um, Gable Road, a lot of these properties were sitting, you know, when I started here, they were idle and there was discussions and they just started happening. And so it's, it was the, the scale and complexity of the projects. And, you know, that one was one that was um, approved before this body in 2018, I believe, the apartment complex on Gable Road. And um, it, since then, um, you know, it's taken a lot of time. Now, right now it's, in the construction phase, it hasn't taken much planning time, but once they start asking for final inspections, it will once again. So the, the line item for each year of uh, permit value by or project value by permit. Mm. Do you have on that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because that was would... average of the permit uh, project values. Right? Yeah, that's a good that idea. would be a representation that would say, "Hey, yeah, no, it's down, but you're a lot busier." Yeah, that is a good idea. Yeah. Another thing we can do is um, now that we have e-permitting the building department, we can track how many planning inspections there are. So that kind of helps represent um, what Jacob's talking about at the end of a project. That'd be good to have to. Planning inspections pick up. Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't cover um, general building permits like single family dwelling homes. It's just a building permit. It's not a land use permit. And that's another, that's another metric that's not captured. So maybe maybe he was alluding to this, but you have these kind of number games that at the state and number of permits um, that I'm processing, whatever, doesn't take into account that one of those, you know, I've spent 3,000 hours on, you know, and so this just a number of yeah. these things. There's, is there any way to... Uh, but processing the next renewable diesel plant. Yeah. So that was I think that's why project value is a good with well, 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 staff hours for uh, yeah. five hundred value. Yes. Now staff staff hours is not something that we document um, precisely. We we started then, to actually have a, a scoring on which time was was spent on this. We kind of calculate for maybe charging different fees for, for different kinds of projects. But is it based on a metric of assumed time? No, we're actually trying to keep track of our time. Oh, okay. It was a study for a while. We're not doing it now, but yeah. 
I know I know in, in mayhem times, just trying to keep up, you know, those kind of details are, are challenging. Um, and another example, partitions. So you remember the Schlumberger partition, you know, that, that was huge. And it's just two parcels, but it's just, you know, you get into the right neighborhood and in the right circumstances. But it sounds like you're, as a body, interested in improving this matrix. Not so much improving it, but, um, you know, there's been talk of potentially additional staff needed in the planning department and a better representation of, of what your workload actually is might be helpful there. In, in this, looking at this at first glance, doesn't really give you that. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't tell the whole story. And I, I think as the planning department becomes more proactive, and I expect that if I expect that the, the proposals that we're going to make, we're going to become vigorously more proactive in 2023. There are a lot of things we might have proposed uh, to sit down and to kind of do a, have a different dynamic of planning and the planning commission being involved and actually adopting plans. I think that the demands upon the planning department potentially are going to increase. And I think having that metric, I think having that metric ready, um, in addition to the other metrics, is going to help get resources to the planning department. Um, I think it's very important. We discussed this last year yeah. about an additional planner. And one of the things we were talking about, um, you know, I was thinking about is you know, how much you start looking at some of these ambitious plans the planning department may take on how much would it cost to have um, advisors, staff, studies? Uh, it could take up a lot of time in the planning department. I'm thinking, okay, if we were to outsource that, it'd be $150,000, $200,000. I don't know what the cost of these things are, but it would be a lot. And, and so I think that additional resources to help plan and, and to help you guys continue to do your jobs is going to be something that I see as being part of the discussion in the future of the council. Last year, we came forward with a budget to ask for an additional plan. And I think we should again be pushing that. I think we need an additional plan uh, because both of you are being asked to do a tremendous amount of work. You're doing in an excellent fashion. I think you need to, I, I just think you would be benefited greatly by, by additional help. So not only these metrics, but the other yes. things that we may be doing into the future, getting help. And, and the, law, the laws become more complex. And so things do become more time consuming. And you know how, how do you add the complexity in that? I guess that's a yeah, We're growing a great deal and there's a lot of very complex and large projects that the city's taking on. And simultaneously. Um, and uh, that's going to require a lot of focus. So at the same time, there are a lot of things that business owners and citizens come to me with saying, we, you know, we really want to make some changes here. And that's part of the impetus of some of these proposed plans. And I just want to make sure, I, I, I want to make sure we have resources. The city has resources. The citizens have resources to move forward in a way that's productive, correct, effective. Hi. Who's my party? It's okay. Well, we could go back yeah. to, uh, I mean, we're just on F, we could go back to E now that we have full. Uh, I got a text. You did. It says it's not too late, come now. So, oh, okay, that wasn't mine. <laughs> yeah, none of us are six hours in the emergency room. That's a little bit more. Wow. Yeah, I lost two clients this week and they took me to the emergency rooms. Everybody's fine. Today is fine. But a um, very young person that passed away this week that I supported every day for the last 14 years. So, sure. still a reminder about what our priorities are in life. And for you guys, and for the great community, of course. 
But right. the B I heard was um, whether Dan wants to do it again another year. Is that what he is? Uh, it's it's the question is who do we vote for to be the chair and the vice chair? But how long have you done it? Two years. No, several times. Because Russ was chair when I left. I've been vice, oh, and then I've been I've been chair, and then I've been vice, and then I've been chair. I mean, um, and you did not speak up. Me? No, I don't. <laughs> It's part of my struggles is I'm not willing to, to I don't want to do that job, but I was glad you're here because I, with your background as a city council, you're sitting in that chair, I wondered what your take on the inexperience of only having one year experience and then being a chair. That's it's I was curious. Unprecedented. That be accurate? Unprecedented for somebody to start on the planning commission and start as chair? Yeah. But almost every commission, um, someone starts out as another position prior to being chair. You know, I mean, look at how long Russ had been on for quite a while. Um, Al, Al Peterson had been on it for quite a while. Dan's been here since before I was here the first time. So, I mean, it's usually a lot more experience that is honed. And I, I would, you know, support a new person next year, but I guess I'm just looking for a little more experience. Or if Dan wanted to be chair and he wanted to be vice chair, I would just support that. Because I just think that it does take a little bit of tutelage. I mean, I don't know what the last two years have been like, but I know that in the time that I was on council, we had LUBA appeals, and it's just procedure is very important. Um, knowing how to work with staff and make staff the expert and let staff do their job is really important in that role. That's just my, my take on it. I think that, you know, in all the boards I've won, it's like vice chair is kind of almost like training for chair because if Dan's gone, you're still chair. You're still, it's like, it's like, um, it's like council president. You're still the backup always. You're still the go-to person always. You know, give Russ a break. So I just, you know, that's just my opinion is I'd rather see a little more time on the, because not only, yeah, you've been here a year, but you've got two new council members and you just lost Audrey and Sheila. So, I mean, we're coming from a place where we have a lot of strength on this body to where we have very little bit of strength on this body. And so I just think that a little, I always look at this as like a ship, you know, you may do fast turns, you know, and Dan is kind of a, government person and I know he always plays on he has a lot of government a lot of government know how things work and how they should work. And Russ has always has had that developer eye. So I guess I would support one more year before we close the I wasn't sure. I just heard they're doing elections. You should come now. Is it too late? No, come now. So Okay. So as far as vice chair, I'd I rather not run again because um I'm director of the PUD now, and that's taking a lot of time. And I just right, said, so that's why I said give you a break and have, if, um, are you Charles? No, I'm Steve. Oh, I'm Steve okay. Todd. I've never seen anybody face-to-face. -face. Charles is the people that were here when I left. Charles gone, Zoom. Yeah, he is. Um, yeah. That's Charles. Oh, okay. I'm up here. This guy's there. Yeah, I had only seen the three that were here when I left, so I didn't know. Steve Tashi. So you're sharing in some of my concerns because, um, the history of the all the work that's been put in for the river for our redevelopment and see if you're new on that part it's sometimes when you come in and talk about something that hasn't been done in fact there's the memory of that act that work has actually been done and so visual memory is very critical yeah. especially in this body you know that we don't have audrey or sheila or bill amos or greg I mean, that's just a lot of experience that we lost on this body in the last five years. 20 years. Yeah, 20 plus years on those guys. And everybody's got a different personality. And I've talked to Jacob for eight years about tweaking this body to where it more accurately represents our community. Um, not not a color or an age or a sex thing, but just, just a dynamic where you have builders and environmentalists and moms and business people. and. So if we get a better representation of the spirit of the law that we're charged with representing. So well, you don't you don't know me, but I, I'm an attorney and I, I'm a practice litigator. 
Um, I'm licensed in this state and in California. I've tried 80 civil cases to juries. I've argued hundreds of motions and brought motions. Uh, I'm quite familiar with the law and how to apply law, the law. I've also um, been pro tem judge uh, yeah. where I've sat and presided over hearings involving people livelihoods. Yeah. And um, and so um, the the focus, uh, you know, it's my it's my intended focus is that the primary focus of our planning commission is going to be to plan. Um, and that is something that I was asked to come on board last year uh, to change the dynamic of the planning commission and to move it toward being a proactive uh, planning commission. And I believe that um, this planning commission uh, under new leadership with the new chair uh, will indeed head in that direction. Um, and uh, and we will not miss anything as far as our ability to um, conduct fair hearings and make um, make fair and just uh, land use decisions. Um, and I've worked with Jenny and Jacob, uh, not only on the planning commission, but I've worked, worked with them personally. And I consider them both to be friends. And so, um, I think there are very good reasons for a change in chairmanship um, that um, are needed now, that um, our city is, without a doubt, uh, needing assistance from the Planning Commission in planning and implementing the future of our city. Um, and, and in particular, um, I think that some of the inexperience of the council would greatly benefit from some of the guidance uh, that can be provided under the law of the planning commission. And that's why, um, that's why I think that I would be, do a good job on the things that you missed, um, you know, because you weren't here, was about um, Dan's leadership which I consider to be exemplary and, and a model. And, and in particular, there were a lot of um, decisions during last year where Dan did not agree with the direction that we that he was heading. And yet Dan was able to um, engage, allow us to engage in discussions. Um, and uh, we, we, we voted to be a proactive commission uh, and then under Dan's uh, leadership, we developed procedures to implement so that we can take on proactive items and we, we utilize those procedures at the end of last year. Um, and I expect that those procedures will still be utilized. The, the difference in my philosophy is a prioritization of planning and a need for planning. Um, and uh, and not something that's going to wait a year. Uh, I get people coming up to me all the time about things that they want to change, and uh, they've been asking for change for a long time. And uh, I expect that this body will fulfill its duty under the code and exercise its power. <laughs> it's been a long time um, where the, this commission has not done that. Um, and so I don't, I don't think another year will benefit the citizens of the city. I think that the, that the council will greatly benefit from our engagement in the planning process and moving forward to help it create uh, legislation to, uh, for the betterment of the city. And so that's, that's why I would like to do this, and I think that I'm taking all of your words as cautionary words, and I want to assure you that uh, I'm hoping to be at least 50% as good as Dan. If I'm that good my first year, then that's a heck of a lot of accomplishment. You can grade me at six months if you want. <coughs> I, just, I just have to say that in 
been in this planning commission all the years I've been here, I think it's now 14. Um, we spend hours and hours, sometimes really late hours, just doing hearings and the work of the planning that they reactively, that they asked us to do. Well, we, we took on the ability to do proactive work in addition to all that work. So I'm not sure how the planning commission can transition to a different kind of planning commission and still do the work they need us to do. We need to any more than if we take it on a bit at a time, like we are doing now. How would it how would it be any different than it is now since we're taking on proactive work? I think that um we're going to prioritize planning or start by planning. So at the beginning of the meetings, we're going to talk about our planning agenda items. We're going to discuss the plans that discuss all of our visions of the city. We're going to discuss planning. We're going to discuss types of legislation that's needed in order to move things that uh, the planning commission feels needs to be moved forward with the city. We're going to ask for citizen input. We're going to have a process in that regard. Um, and as far as getting to some of the other um, ideas is that I have an idea of how to streamline those hearings. Um, I think that um, one of the things to do to streamline the hearings is that uh, Jacob and Jenny put together a, a great package on um, presenting um, the various items that we have to make decisions on. But I think it would be helpful if we bullet point <coughs> right at the very beginning, one page saying, okay, these are the items that the planning commission must make decision on. These are the things that we must rule on and, and in whatever particular way so that we can focus our attention to those items. And also um, during the testimony, the citizens that come forward are going to be directed to provide testimony directly on point on the subjects that we are supposed to make decisions on. And, uh, and, and I will try to control the hearings uh, such that, um, you, know, we, you know, I just was at a city council meeting. I was limited to three minutes. And so I think that if, if the citizens is getting off point, I'm going to say, if you don't have anything to add on this point, um, that one of these points, you've got to do that because really your testimony is not something that is anything pertinent to our ruling. Uh, additionally, um, I did take a course last year, and I think that we should all take a course on, uh, in fact, have a retreat about um, what our role is during these sorts of hearings. Because when I took the course last year, which Jenny took and which um, uh, Jennifer took, the, there was an emphasis that the planning commission is supposed to make specific findings concerning hearings. And... Um, we actually started to do that toward the end of last year where I would request we need to make findings. And so I think that having my experience in the law, my experience in judicial decision-making and what it is to make a legal finding, um, I think it will streamline the process and that when we do make findings, they'll have, they'll be very forceful and they will, um, one way or another, whichever way we go on it, are going to be lawful. So I think that we can actually compress the hearings that we have. And then also, uh, I think that um, controlling the amount and, and time of some of the other ancillary things that we discuss will help move the hearings along. But our number one goal is planning. That is our job. Um, and, and our powers and duties are to plan, to have plans, to be more moving forward with our plans, to bringing the plans to the city council, to bring legislation to the city council. That is that is our duty under the statute. So that answers the question that we can move things along and we can get it on. And I'm glad we're starting an hour earlier. So, so planners, um, with, is that the planning commission that would go for you? What are you describing? You get your job done. It sounds like your job is 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 tremendous. Sometimes you do need our help. So it sounds to me like cutting back our help to 
we'll we'll open up more time for other direct planning. Yes, go. See what I'm asking. Um, no. Well, I, we for all the time I've been here, we've been reactive to what your needs are for us to view and to make decisions about. You lay it out for us. Um, and we rule on the on the ordinances and whatever we have at our disposal to be able to make the decisions. Um, bring those to us because we're not too digital and we have to make we have to make those decisions, right? And there's other things that you bring to us to get our input. Would you uh, would you do that less because that's because you don't have to? I see. Um, and that would just take more time. You know, I mean, there's the question of, you know, is it something that the council wants a recommendation on or not? Uh, but it comes down to triage. You know, what's going on, what's important. And, um, you know, that's going to vary depending on the circumstances of the day, week, or month. Uh, and if there's a situation where there's a lot of big developments going on, and the commission is pushing proactive item A and B. They're pushing those really hard. Um, you know, do those conflict with what's in the strategic plan or not as far as triage and, and dealing with all that? Do we have time to care about lesser things? Um, a good analogy is uh, someone who is fed and sheltered um, may worry more about things like climate change than someone who is hungry all the time because those basic needs um, are <laughs> met. And so that's what they're worried about. So it's a it's a it's a triage thing. And I and I think that we can prioritize appropriately based upon the needs expressed by the planning department. And certainly there's a job to do priority one is if we need to make a judicial decision and the time is that would be the top priority we would have to get to it. I think what we may want to do is say, okay, we're going to start the hearing at seven and we're going to do whatever planning or we could decide, you know what, we can postpone discussing these plans um, for one more meeting. Uh, we need to spend more time on some of these other issues that are coming up. It doesn't, you know, there's no hard and fast rules. I think it's, I think that, uh, so I, I guess I hope that answers the question that um, if you have legal priorities and there are legal timelines and things done. And um, if the planning department says, hey, you've got, you know, um, uh, a subdivision plan coming, uh, we're going to need to make sure that we make appropriate time. Um, that's going to be something that we may decide to juggle the calendar on and make sure that we handle the needs of the planning department, can't abrogate those. Those would be the first priority. So I, it, we're kind of getting into um, item K, which seems like a pretty good precursor to new proactive items. I just, before you jump there, can I just ask one question? Now, are you suggesting, I heard you say start at seven, that the first hour is like a work session hour, and then we start the hearings at seven? Is that what you're proposing? That's an idea. That's a proposal is that we, you know, what I'd like to do is to sit down and talk about our vision of St. Helens, each and every one of our visions of St. Helens, um, and how are we going to get there? Um, you know, something that I have on my, um, on my, email is a goal without a plan is nothing but a dream and so what i'd like to do is you know if i were the chair the next meeting we would probably meet for the first hour down there and we would face each other and we would all talk about each of us would get a chance and an opportunity to talk about our goals for st helens um, what we see as concerns for st helens <clears throat> Um, uh, different things that citizens have come forward with St. Helens. Uh, ultimately, what is the vision for St. Helens? What, what, how do people picture our city in five years, in 10 years? Commissioner Toski, are you proposing that as chair, you would set the planning commission agenda? Is as that, chair? That's not a rule that our chair has ever done. No. 
is set the planning commission agenda. I think as chair, I can pick whichever agenda item I want to start with. I think this is this comes back to the experience thing and working with staff in a in a productive manner that Jimmy Carlson mentioned when she walked in. Um, I've never seen the chairman um, single handedly set an agenda. I had one one other point of just point of order is no one on this board was elected by the citizens of this community. That man over there was. Um, so as we are not elected, we're just appointed. Um, it's not up to us to dictate really anything. It's up to us to enforce the code as it is written and make recommendations about code changes. Um, so it's like, I find it hard to step into what an elected position is versus an appointed position. Um, you know, you're pushing those boundaries, which is all oh, great. It's all about change. I'm totally up for change, but I just, he comes to one every single hearing he's ever had because he knows what he's doing. And so sometimes I'm not so ready to throw the baby in the bath out when something's working. Um, I mean, I'm all about change and I haven't watched any meetings just as self-care. I kind of walked away from meetings two, two years ago just to take care of my family. Um, so I don't know what's happened in the last two years since you took place and with the ladies gone, but you know, I'm all about embracing new new ideas and new techniques, but I'm not, government doesn't turn on a dime. That's just my opinion. So, so it, you know, Jenny made a point and that is about the agenda. Our proactive items get pushed to the bottom of the agenda. And at the, one of the last planning commission meetings we had, I was literally shouted at on an HB 3115 discussion by Jacob that everything gets so late here and we can't make any decisions. And, um, and so rearranging our agenda items um, to plan uh, when we're fresh, when we need to talk about it, will help us make the best decisions uh, versus waiting until the end of the calendar. Um, and um, and just because something hasn't been done before, it doesn't mean it's the best idea. Our priority un under the law, that is our law, and I think everybody should read it very carefully. We have 18 paragraphs of duties. Duties, not choices, not this is what you know we want to do. It is a duty, and I take those 18 paragraphs of duties very seriously. And that is what I told when I started last year in January. I said the same thing. They are duties. And one of those duties, many of them, is to plan and to have plans, to be developing plans, to be making sure the city is going to be able to follow through on its plans. Um, the city has plans. We have the right to look into what the city's plans are and to make sure the city can actually follow through and do its plans. We have the duty to look out for the economic vitality of our citizens. We have the duty to look out for the business interests. We have the duty to look out for the citizens' interests. We have the duty to look out for the vacation of the city. Those are our duties. And we have the duty, we have a duty to plan. In addition to all those 18 paragraphs of duties that I just said, we have the power to do all of them. And duty means duty and power means power. And this planning commission needs to take the power that it has. It needs to follow its duties and it needs to help our city government stay on the right track because there are a lot of things, a lot of people pulling them in different directions and the city government will benefit from a planning commission that is following its mandate under the law. So um, if that, and I understand the planning commission for many years has not done that. And um, I was asked to come to this planning commission by Audrey and Sheila and Jennifer and Russ Hubbard to move this planning commission into a proactive stance and to have this planning commission implement its powers and duties under the law. 
and I appreciate Mr. Hubbard's uh, 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 nominating me as chair, and I appreciate um, Mr. Lowe's um, seconding that. And I can assure you again that this is going to be a facilitating, I plan to facilitate discussion. Next, Jacob. Well, um, you know, they talked about delaying to make sure we had a full group um, because there was the motion in the second. And, and a vote. And a vote. Yeah, there was a vote. Or a vote. And what? Well, part of the council vote until we realized you weren't here to vote. Oh, you started to vote. Well, we did vote. Okay, well then. And we, agreed, we agreed to wait till you came to have a say. Did you come? So I say, you know. Well, the harvest was a messed up a little bit, but could we have a revote? Would that be okay? Well. Did you guys vote or did you vote to, to wait? Well, there, there was a vote and then there was, well, wait a minute. Maybe we wait for um, Councillor. Uh, too many years. Uh, <laughs> Eight years Commissioner <laughs> Carlson. I gotta I gotta get that out of my system. Um so when I heard that, okay, well, this is probably gonna go to next month. The motion in second, I don't know if that would really carry over to the next month. Of course, now we're here at the same night. I think the question is if you do revote, is everybody gonna be okay with that? Let's start it again. Um, can we ask for the counselor's input? Sure. Well, you, you can just kind of introduce yourself. I don't know. My name is Ask that. So I am the uh, newly elected city councilman. Um, I, I tend to agree with. Uh, I see. I see both sides of it. And so I, I, I'm going to go with your experience since you've been doing this for quite some time and what you what you feel is the right direction. For me, it's always been uh, a learning process that it takes time to learn to how to be an effective leader. And at this point, no offense, Steve, but you seem to be taking control of everything before you've even gotten a chance to take control. So at that point, I think another year under your belt might be a benefit. I wouldn't certainly wouldn't accept the nomination to be president of the city council just being in my first year. Matter of fact, I don't want the role of president for the city council. But I also see his point too, um, in the in the sense that he wants things to move forward, he wants things to move quicker. But I think you need to do it within the confines of the way that the structure has been built. Does that make sense? It does, and I have a response to that. I don't think the city can afford to wait for the planning commission to be proactive for another year. You I want think to, that the city. Then I'm interested to hear why not. Our I is proactive. I know. We, I know. It's a methodology for being proactive that we've adopted and been yeah. open to. And, and I would say that, you know, I think the planning commission used to be more proactive when staff was presenting more stuff like that to them. Um, but I don't know, maybe. 2016, you know, the state throwing stuff at us, the development staff's been very reactionary. So we have not been able to help the planning commission be proactive. So to say the planning commission has ever been proactive, I don't, I don't completely agree with that. Well, Steve, I'd like to, I'd like to know what is it that you feel that, that needs to be, um, that, that needs to be so proactive. What, what, are, what are those line items that you need that we need to have happen right now? It's, it's if we don't, the city's going to burn down. What is that? Well, I don't think it's the city's going to burn down. And you know, I have I have a number of, of proactive items that that were up for discussion at this meeting. Yeah, the beginning. She's just getting water. It's kind of no, no. I'm just stating that they're on the agenda. Several put that out there. Um. They're discussing this. Oh, sorry, that's thank you. Yeah, no, because it's a memo with all kinds of stuff. Um, but when they talk about it, you'll. Okay. Yeah, I guess, you know, I'm granted, I've not watched meetings for the last two years, just self indulgent. But, you know, the planning commission I left was very proactive, was very into hearing all sides. Um, they listened to every issue I ever brought up because you don't know me that well, uh, Mr. Tashi, but. 
I travel a lot in a lot of communities in Oregon and I have a different perspective on things and I would bring things back. It's like, why aren't we doing cottage clusters? Why aren't we doing, you know, all these different things that I'm seeing in all these communities that are within a hundred miles up here. And it's just, you know, everything in its time, everything in its place. And I never got shut down and I never felt like the planning commission was ignoring an issue. It was, you know, the giant fire first. And that's just the way this body has worked. And I think that's what the council counts on us to do is that when a big issue comes up, we've already addressed it. You know, I mean, there are things that have slid with all the code changes slid to the, you know, to the low side, but there's also meetings in the year that maybe there shouldn't be ducking out of here in an hour and 10 minutes, but should stay and work on those other things because there are meetings that are shorter. Not every meeting goes to midnight. Maybe they do now. I haven't watched recently. <laughs> but I'm just saying I'm I'm all for proactive and I don't think that re revolves around what seat you sit in because every single person, in fact, if I remember correctly, the, the chair doesn't vote. Um, so it's the rest of us that vote and you all play an active role. No one is muzzled or stopped in any way from exercising their views or adding input to any decision. I, I remember when Al sat in that chair, he goes, I'm not, you know, he goes, I only vote in the event of a tie. And it's just like the mayor, we're all equal. So it's not like somebody's like almighty ruler or anything. You know, that's just my opinion. And I mean, that's why I'm asking for staff's input. I asked for Councilor Gunderson's opinion. You know, eight years of sitting in that chair, I saw a lot of ups and downs and, you know, a lot of stuff that, you know, it's a very fine walk of, community livability and representing the citizens and executing the law. And it's a fine line we walk to make sure that we can back up and substantiate our viewpoints and our findings. We can't just, you know, vote with the birds or the trees or the developer or the my friend or whoever. You have to be able to take the livability and make it applicable to the rule. Make sure you're doing that fairly because before I ever got elected, there were some people that always won in this room and there were some people that always lost. And people are like, that's not true. And I go, I see it and I hear it in the community. And so that's why I'm here is to just carry on that tradition that this council, this body has really worked on to be fair and transparent. So, I mean, that's why I just won. I didn't hear what the two of you had. I've heard from Mr. Toshi and Dan, Russ and Russ, 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 have been pretty quiet. I mean, we can do a vote or we cannot do a vote. It's, I came into this at intermission, so. Well, it sounds like, just, go ahead. I just wanted to say, I guess I got a point of order is that we've already had a motion, we've had a second, we had a, we had a vote. Uh, it did not include Ms. Carlson who wasn't there yet. So exactly where are we and, and how do we go forward in a way that it's gonna be appropriate? So the question is if if everybody is okay doing a revote under the circumstances or not. Um, I am. And if everybody's okay with that, I assume we're not going to receive scrutiny from you know the paper or the media or anybody else. I make a motion we do a revote. Second. So all bitter. Aye. 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 Now it's clean. <laughs> okay. All right. Do we have a, a motion for uh, a chair um, selection? You want to start one at a time? Mm -hmm. Start over again. Do again. We have a motion for a chair selection. Uh, motion is uh, Steve Toski then. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Passes. We have a, a, a motion for a vice chair. 
I know Dan carries with my advice chair. I'll second that. Aye. Aye. I will accept that position. Okay. All right. We'll move on. Well, it's epic. Chair, vice chair. <laughs> That's what I think we've had. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, we need the planning director decisions. The email of the president and staff. Um, planning department activity report. So, so this, that's not what we just shared, is it? It's Andrew, no, that's just the monthly stuff that happened in the last month. Anything that from the activity report someone would like to ask about? Press. No, no, not this year. Not this year. Well, look at this. This is a proactive item. This is a proactive um. Amazing. Thank you, All right. uh, Dan. Are we an update on HB 3115? Yeah. Uh, Jenny, would you mind pulling up the PowerPoint? Can I just jump in here real fast? I think it's been a real win in it all on Commissioner Toski pushing so hard that it seems like we're getting somewhere on this 3115. My Frustrations with the proactive um, agenda is that proactive planning commission isn't two people. It's everybody jumping in. And, uh, I was guilty of saying I'd be on the 3115 and I had no input. Um, so it's all on you. And you did a great job. And how the mayor say to initiate a task force is a big win for you and it's a big win for the planning commission. I do have a comment to make about on that regard too. And I, I tell you, when I was in graduate school, there was a fellow graduate student and he had been six years on his two-year master's degree because his his question was too big. He couldn't narrow it down enough to ever wrap it up. And when we decided to take on these proactive items, I thought we would be taking on things that we as a body could come to fruition and present and say, here's the whole package. Council, can we find money for that or whatever? Um, something that you could actually get your hands around. This would seem like too big a question. And like I said before, two attorney heavy. So really it was subcommittee one person. It really isn't subcommittee just one person. So it's a that, that's a problem. I think we need to make sure that any future proactive items, that there's actually a community to work on it. It's not just more well, another Steve Takashi idea that he's going to put and take on all of It's not a committee. That is not going to be very helpful for, for the rest of us to help with. Doesn't it become a committee, though, when you have the city jump in and say, okay, we're going to assign I mean, it's great that it's gonna, it's gonna happen yeah. but what what the yeah, no, what I agree. your input but it, it and, and you expressed how much work you had it was like I put in 50 hours already we need to hire somebody well that was a big red flag that was too big a question it was something you couldn't handle it was too big a question that, that was, that's that's just my input I just don't think about it and would you mind if I responded? Sure, sure. Okay, so as far as trying to get more involvement on the HB 3015 committee, I, I did reach out to Jennifer and to Russ and tried to put forward discussions and it seemed that life was pulling them in their own direction. So it wasn't for lack of trying to get them involved to have a discussion. I didn't just run off on my own. I, I tried to get people in, and and there were several times where I did call them, and we kind of had to some discussion. So it wasn't for lack of trying. Um, secondly, one of the things that I think that we should do because is is that if if either Russ or Jennifer don't think that they have time to continue with uh, the HB three one subcommittee, 
Um, then I think uh, Mr. Kasner um, uh, and, um, has expressed an interest in becoming involved. And also during one of the meetings um, uh, that we had for the task force, Ginny Carlson's name also came up as somebody who would be a good addition to the HB 3115 uh, subcommittee. Uh, so the, uh, Charles bringing a law background, additional law background, because this is really quite a legal problem for the city. And Ms. Carlson was thought about her community effort, her role in the community, and can help us bring perspective from her point of view, among others, by the way. So um, along those lines, Dan, number one, I have some other comments on some other things, but along those lines, I tried. In, you know, I kept going with it because I had a job to do. But going forward, um, there is room if, if if Jennifer feels that you know, she'd like to step out of it and potentially maybe step out of this one. Um, you know, Mr. Kasner and Ms. Carlson have both been uh, invited to participate. So let me back up was we just said so. You said the committee members basically backed out and you still had a job to do. Why, is, why did you still think that was a job for you that it was supposed to be a subcommittee project? Maybe it was, maybe it couldn't go on then because it wasn't a subcommittee. It got, I think we have to think about that. We're gonna have the subcommittee, we should have it as an active subcommittee. And if, if it falls apart, then it's not a project for the subcommittee. It, it was an active subcommittee. I mean, I, mean, I know you, you're, you're, you're passionate about it. And it's an important thing and keep going on and I appreciate it you did, but I, I did not back out of it. Uh, I was was unable to devote more time to it than I did, but I yeah. did not back out of it. Thank you, Russ. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's not it's not put down on anybody no, for not having clear. time. Sure, I mean that's that's why I wasn't interested in the first place. I had no I had no bandwidth for adding more work for my for me. I was just too you know I was up here. Well, and that's one of the discussion points on proactive items. Is I, I think that people, um, you know, either we're going to have the time to take them on or we're not. I mean, that's one of the that's one of the kind of the, uh, we're you volunteers. Know. We have other jobs, and you know, so so a lot of us have time to do it. Right. So it's got to be retired already. So I think you know what that's uh, time since I've retired. <laughs> I did before. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so like at this point, and then and then yeah, right. I, just, I just wanted, I just wanted. Well, I would like to retable at some point the discussion about uh, about potentially uh, substituting some members that maybe it'd be better after the presentation. Okay. Back to the PowerPoint. One, one more thing. Um, you mentioned that Jacob got upset when we were going so late another time. Make sure that your presentation doesn't go over and over stuff we've already gone over. That was what he was upset about. So for multiple months, you repeated the same thing. So make sure that it's something, something proactive here, not reactive from re back there, rehashed. No, we don't need rehash. We've already been there. You've already told us all about it. I, you know, Ms. Carlson's new and uh and um and so, uh, and so is Mr. Kastner. So, uh, forgive me if I if I slightly uh, uh, revisit some ground. Okay. Um, so, uh, HB three one one five. Let's try to keep it moving. Okay. Under federal law, uh, if there are not enough shelters for homeless people, the city cannot prohibit camping and sleeping <laughs> on all uh, public property within the city. Uh, sleeping uh, and keeping warm are basic human functions and a person cannot be punished for it if they have uh, no place to go. Um, and so uh, meeting with community, I, I met with the community action team. Uh, St. Helens has a greater homeless population than it has shelter beds. Some homeless cannot live in a shelter environment as well, meaning um, they're, they actually have criteria to try to fill their beds. Some people they know in advance aren't gonna make it and try to get people who are going to succeed 
in in being in shelter beds. Uh, the the bottom line is is that I think that we don't have shelter beds to meet all of the homeless in St. Helens is probably a fact that we need to assume uh, 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 is true. Uh, the only campground in St. Helens uh, has on public land and open to the public is Sand Island, charge the fee. So that is not gonna be a qualifying uh, campground. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So next St. Helens will need to create places to camp for free on public land open to the, to the public. Um, the city uh, will need to develop time, place, and manner restrictions. So when we're talking about place restrictions, we're talking about places where people who have no home can go to sleep, to get warm, to stay dry. Um, you know, for example, if, if somebody were to be um, you know, right now, if they were to go to the waterfront and pitch a tent, we would say, look, you can't camp here, but there is a place for you to go. Um, so the, so what we're talking about is time, place, and manner restrictions, but I think logically it's best to think about them as place, manner, and time, because where are people going to be allowed to camp? So under place restrictions, areas where camping is allowed for the public for free. And so some discussion points for the planning commission and for the public in general should be, where should these places be? Um, where are they already? Uh, and on um, should, th should these camping places be on the industrial property or other property somewhere? Which side of the highway? within neighborhoods, within a park or parks. Um, and then there are concerns that camping within neighborhoods and parks has uh, traditionally ever the city. Parks was allowed, camping was allowed at um, uh, Mormick, and I was on council when that camping was banned. Right. For reasonable findings. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so, um, you know, that's been tried and, and it hasn't worked. Um, one of the things, one of the thoughts on this is, uh, where are the homeless camping already? I think that we uh, have to, you know, one of the ideas is to treat people humanely. And people make decisions. Um, there are people that are camped where they are, out of our view, uh, for reasons of their own. And maybe one of the things we should consider is um, property that where people are already camping that is owned by the city, um, that is out of sight, out of mind, wherever these folks, we should maybe just allow it there as part of our plan for camping. So that uh, there are a lot of people who just want to be alone. People do things that they want to be able to see. I, you know, they have their reasons for being where they are. And, and allowing that potential use of public land is something to be considered. Um, we have the industrial property, uh, there are areas that, and Jacob has an entire map of the public lands that are available. These are, this is just the beginning of the discussion of where would a campground, be, and that's what we're talking about, campgrounds, or places where people are allowed to camp. Next slide, please. So manner restrictions. Um, so now we have camps. You decide, okay, you can camp in these areas. Now we have rules for these camps. Uh, sure, there'll be a camp for citizens of St. Helens. So if you want to go in this camp, you need to be a citizen here. Um, you know, maybe there are, you know, there are people that um, get thrown out of their parents' house and they need a place to go. Maybe somebody's been couch surfing and that thing's ended. They need some place. They live here. But they suddenly can't, are unsheltered. Um, that that would be something to discuss. Uh, potentially a citizens camp, a visitors camp, somebody who's a vagabond coming through town, a free spirit. Who knows? Um, you know, people travel. Um, Oregon is a place of free spirits. Should we have a visitors camp? Uh, should there be a free for all camp where? meaning like this place in the forest I'm talking about. This is just out in the woods and uh, 
y'all can go there and we're not hardly going to look at you. Um, manner of camping, amenities to the camps. I think that these are these are not campgrounds that we should be thinking about are only for the homeless. Uh, these are going to be campgrounds that are open to the public. And I think that we should try to have, this is my opinion, amenities at these campgrounds that we would have for any other campground, trees, bushes, uh, tables, water, toilets, garbage services. Uh, and we know that people are going to need to sleep there. People may need help because these will be poor people, people who are struggling. Um, I don't think that these are camps that we should be creating that are, uh, this is my opinion, that are some kind of junk camps. I think that they, there should be trees surrounding them, uh, that these should be things that we are being compassionate and treating people mainly. Um, it's a public campground open to the public. It's not a homeless campground. Assisted camps, um, uh, like for example, persons who are trying to climb out of homelessness, um, maybe there would be rules in this camp to help them. So we could focus a campground for people who are trying to get over addiction uh, and clean and sober campground, for example. These are things that I think we should work with all the people who work with the people in need to help understand what their needs are and how we can help meet them. Safety in the camps, rules in the camps to promote safety. Um, and some of the things that I've looked at online about uh, homeless people, they wanna be safe. You know, you've got some homeless people that are real dangerous, but you've got some homeless folks that are women, children, um, they are peaceful people. Uh, they want a place where they know they can lay their head and not be raped, robbed, uh, beaten up. Um, and um, our campgrounds should try, I think we should have uh, areas where we can say, look, if you come to this campground, this is a campground where there are going to be rules and safety is going to be promoted. Pallets, places to sleep, rehabilitation requirements in camps, and I already mentioned that. That's just kind of, these are thoughts. These are manner restrictions. Time restrictions. How long can a person camp? And which camps can a person camp? What form of it, identification do we require to use the camps? Should we require background checks for some camps? These are questions. Uh, because we do have a duty to protect our citizens um, and to make sure that um, we aren't attracting um, people who may not otherwise be running from the law or be dangerous. Um, next and our police, we have a duty to protect our police too. Uh, protecting public property. So I think the big one of the bigger threats under HB 3115 is places that we don't select at camp sites will need to be defended regarding place, time, and manner restrictions. In other words, our rules are going to say you cannot camp on the riverfront, for example. You cannot camp on the kayak launch, for example. You cannot camp in McCormick Park. We will need to defend those decisions potentially in court. And we need to be working toward evidence-based evidence uh, reasons why these place, time, and manner restrictions are reasonable and are reasonable uh, for people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so why should not camping be allowed in neighborhoods, in parks, on the waterfront? Uh, one issue that is going to need to be coming up for discussion is what do we do about public property from other public entities in the city? For example, can't, example county land and port land within the city. Uh, the port property has some homeless folks on it. I don't think it's public, public or to the public. Uh, for example, what if the county decides uh, that they're going to have a homeless campground in a place that the city does not feel appropriate? Uh, can our regulations reach those entities? How will they reach those entities? These are things, these are discussion points and things to think about. Next slide, please. So would you mind backing up one slide? Oh, go ahead. Well, I help you with nothing. You said uh, they shouldn't camp on the waterfront, say. You, could, um, you should check to see 
you know, the water the, the property below ordinary high water is the highlands have been sold. Um, otherwise, there's state property and there's juice public and rights to camp and have fires and uh, do anything but have a business actually there. So, uh, a lot of the waterfront on the city was the 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 Thailands were sold quite a bit of it in St. Helens, but I don't, you know, I don't. Thailands were sold to the state? From the state. To the city. They were state, right? Or state owned state to owned to Ordinary High Wine from statehood. It, 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 you know, it's statehood. And so, help me understand. So, statehood, the, the federal government gave the state two sections of every township and all the submerged and submersible lands to generate money for the school system. For the on the school fund, and about half of those lands have been sold or swindled out of over the years, and um, a lot of uh, high lands. That's the area from high, ordinary high water down to um, low water, or or low tide. If you're in a tile area, um, could have been sold to like in Columbia City or sold to shipbuilders, and so. Uh, at some point, it's not private land anymore. It's um, public land. But the lower Nanhe water, there, even you know, on the private land, there is, and I'm not an authority on it, so I believe I used to be an authority, but it's called Juice Public. They have a right to walk below Nanhe water on private land, even if, even if the tight lands were sold. And they can camp, they can have fires. They can't do a business, a lot of things. So, so I believe you're correct on that. Up to the high water mark is free going. I work for the Department of State Lands. Um, so like most of Sand Island is is state owned. You can camp there for 14 days without without permit, without paying the fee. That's how that. Uh, um, so anyway, you just just you just have to know that has to enter into this. I think that's a great point. And I think one of the things you talked about at the last meeting was uh, to try to negotiate a lease from the state on uh, Sand Island and then also potentially leasing these other properties. I think it's, you know, so Charles would probably, you know, or it, well, we probably should be talking about those aspects and, and tightening that loophole up if you would. So there's a number of places in Portland, the Vanderbilt Delta, and other places that the homeless camps got so bad that they that they were banned from camping there and uh, for overnight. So they are still closed to the public. But there's an official thing that uh, the landlord has to make the landlord, the governor, the secretary of state, and the treasurer. They're my they're my bosses. Um, and so anyway, just it, it takes special circumstances for that to happen. Okay. So anyway. Just some important people here with the state. Thank you. And then should we check with you? Nope, not me. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, somebody would be not a proprietary oh, person. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. You know what? I already talked about cats. So that let's just go to the next. Uh, uh, well, okay. Current process. So, so uh, yeah, this is it. So, so where we're at now, cities retain an attorney through its insurance carrier. Uh, and John Walsh, who's the city administrator, Jacob Gretchen, the plan director, Steve Totsky, and Charles Gavner. We have a meeting set up with this attorney tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Um, and some of the items that we're going to discuss is the efficacy of developing our laws under ORS 203.077 or 203.079, which potentially can provide a complete defense to any action under HB 3115 uh, and to eliminate the affirmative defense in criminal cases. So basically HB 3115 just to review creates a cause of action where the city can be sued by anybody uh, on a class basis saying, we don't like that we can't camp in McCormick Park. It's not objectively reasonable to the homeless and they can sue and seek injunction. Uh, and if we try to enforce our anti-camping ordinance, then an affirmative defense is that the law itself is not objectively reasonable as to the homeless. There appears to be a loophole 
And so the attorneys can analyze that. Um, the attorney, we're going to discuss the Beth methods to gather evidence supporting place restrictions. Um, we're going to discuss retaining experts regarding the effect homeless camps have on working house populations. The camps are placed too close to working house populations. Uh, the, the idea is basically to be able to defend our place um, decisions. Um, I, I'm thinking where we do have the camps, I doubt we're going to get sued um, that the camps, the pan camps we do have are wrong. I think we're going to get sued uh, saying that there should be uh, you know, greater areas where people should be able to camp. Um, Retain experts regarding divisions of camps, citizens temporary. In other words, talking about these different types of camps. Uh, legal opinions concerning identification of persons in the camps, basically. Legal opinion of, um, you know, we have this camp, it's open to the public. Um, what means can we use to, to identify people that are in them? Uh, what are the circumstances where that would be allowed? How much identification can we require? Um, and then essentially to discuss about defending the objective reasonableness of the St. Helens program from the perspective of the homeless. Um, uh, and then part of the process is we are also scheduled to meet with all of the stakeholder, all of the, the service agencies that uh, interface with with people who are the houses people um you know and to get their input on how we can best design uh yeah here we go in the months ahead uh we're gonna work closely with homeless advocacy groups to best create a system that is objectively reasonable as to the homeless people and to implement as many policies as possible to assist with recovery uh, at the very least, provide a framework. We have legal places for people to sleep and keep warm and dry on public property, open to the public, and then build our defenses to defend open space, parks, waterfronts, and neighborhoods from legal challenges, trying to open those places up for public camping. I think the primary objective, though, in working closely with the advocacy groups is to is to number one, respect the people and treat them like human beings uh, and to um, assist these groups to the extent possible in providing services to people so that the, rather than people being hidden out in the woods, my thinking is, is it just me that I'm hoping that these camps can be a place where outreach can be more effective and we can help people with whatever ails them such that they can move towards shelters, they can get jobs, get off drugs, get the mental health assistance they need, uh, all the reasons for uh, people who are are struggling and and these are the things that the advocacy groups would know best about. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Parks Department has assigned two people to be on the task force. Um, and the city will include the Planning Commission task force in meeting with the homeless advocacy groups. Um, I don't know the process we're in, but public hearings could be held by the planning commission. This is something we should probably discuss at the next meeting, whether we want to hold public meetings and in what type in March or April. Uh, I think this is something that would guide us when talking to council. Um, findings of humane treatment, can they be made by the planning commission? Uh, depending on evidence in the advice of council meeting, why are these things humane? Why are they objectively reasonable? I'm very interested in hearing what our lawyers have to say about this. And, and by the way, this fellow that's working on this, we aren't the only cities representing on these issues. Um, and then the idea is to draft legislation for council review uh, uh, that's created and submitted by May of 2023. 
and that would give the council two months to um, to uh, chew on, question, revise, hold hearings. Um, I think the planning commission should participate in meetings with council. I think we have we probably will have a joint meeting at least in the first quarter. And I think that we probably should present once we kind of get closer along this thing. At some point, we may present to council. This is kind of a loose outline of where I see the process headed. Um, so we're talking about land use planning, um, where, how, what's legal. And these are things that we're going to come back with to the planning commission uh, in, in connection with Jacob to discuss um, the, you know, the, all of these issues. Next, um, we'll help develop evidence and strategies for the district attorney to successfully overcome challenges to enforce anti-camping, sleeping, lying laws. In other words, if we want, we want to be able to enforce our laws and we want the district attorney to be able to overcome the um, uh, the affirmative defense that the laws are unreasonable, we should be able to convince a judge that our laws are reasonable and why. We should be ready to come forward. Our, our district attorney should, should not be making this up. The very first challenge he or she has, there should be, there's all this stuff and they're going to come forward and the idea is to win those issues. Uh, we also are talking about vehicles. Um, uh, where do vehicles go? What are the time and place manner restrictions on vehicles? Uh, and then what about time, place, and manner restrictions that do not involve camping? These are going to be things that we may need to discuss. Hopefully not, but well, maybe not. Um, let's see. Funding sources need to be sought. Um, so you know, this is going to cost money, right? We're going to actually carve out some of our land. I talked to Jeff Yarborough, who's a commercial real estate person. Uh, he says uh, commercial properties now trading at something like $700,000 an acre or something like that. So if we set aside uh, three acres for a camp, uh, the city's giving up $2.1 million in uh, land. Um, you know, where is the state going to pay us for this? Is the federal government going to pay us for this? Um, um, so I think these are things that uh, we need to think about. And then preventing homelessness in St. Helens. Um, you know, I think we, we need to be careful that we, we take care of our own. And that's how we started with this discussion. We take care of our own. Uh, we want to make sure that people from St. Helens that fall in hard times are cared for that when our neighbors fall, we pick them up. Um, but we're a town of 14,000 people and we aren't going to be able to handle homeless from all over or even from Portland for that matter. Um, and, and, and I understand there are people that come through town here. Um, so I think enforcing our laws, littering, being drunk in public, stoned in public, possession of illegal materials, vehicle registration, these are things that if we enforce these laws, maybe the people who are living a homeless life won't come here in the first place. And then um, public education about what can every citizen can do. So here's our discussion. I mean, and I threw this out here. We could discuss it another day. We could discuss it in another meeting, but I thought we, the planning commission could start Maybe next meeting we could discuss places, manner, time, water, garbage, toilet, identification people, local and visitor camps. Just like Jenny uh, and Jacob came forward today with ideas concerning the stage, maybe we should uh, brainstorm that. Maybe people want to see more before we start brainstorming. That that was kind of where. I thought we could springboard off of my presentation. Um, and that's up to you, Mr. Carey. Well, I thought that, uh, that your work shows some really good work there. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate that. Thank you, Dan. I, I yeah. worked really hard at it, and I appreciate it. We do need something. Um, Commissioner Toski talked about the Parks Commission 
um, having people for the task force. Names have been uh, put out there, but we want to make sure that the uh, planning commission is a body it's acceptable to uh, Commissioner Kastner and Commissioner Carlson, um, who kind of been the default folks for this um, task force. I don't want to get rid of low Russ if he wants to stick with it, but uh, certainly we got a lot of other proactive items coming up. Russ, you may want to jump in on those too. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to step out of that, that committee. Okay. And, and this isn't this isn't a so I mean the subcommittee is your thing. Um, this is the task force at the joint planning commission city council meeting. We talked about a camp task force where a variety of people, agencies, <laughs> uh, and groups to work on it. And a lot of cities have done it that way. And um, Steve's uh, input on that was because the planning commission had take it, taken it on as a proactive item, um, there should be a strong representation, more than three, of course, as a quorum. So we're limited to three for, for that purpose. Um, but that is an important thing that we wanted to get tonight is at least consent of the people who would be on the task force. Well, I think Charles. Do you accept, do you accept your position? <laughs> yes, Charles. Charles has has kind of agreed to it, um, but in the context of the Joint Planning Commission City Council, we just want to kind of formalize it, make sure everybody's okay. Um, tonight. Yeah, I mean. I had um, spoken to Mr. Tashi prior about, you know, he was very excited in November and December, but it's like, I, there are already people in my seat. I can't talk until January. So um, no, it's including everybody in our community has always been my mission, whether it's, you know, seniors, people that experience homelessness, people with disabilities, whatever, it's making sure everybody has a seat at the table. So that's my wheelhouse. Well, we want you there. Yeah, that's my deal. That's my that's my game. Good. Good. I'm glad you're on it. Yeah, and I didn't know if this by you. I am on um, community action team board as well. Great. So, I think this collaborative effort. I think we have a chance to really do something great. Yeah, I'm encouraged by the involvement of the nonprofits involved in the community, and there's I'm interested to look at that list because there's some service providers out there that maybe not everybody knows about that serve um, people under 21 that are experiencing homelessness. A lot of, um, we have a very large homeless youth population in this town, more so than adults, because of uh, toxic situations and their home life has led them to be couch surfing. I've taken in friends of my kids a few times that had no place to go. So that's, that's a population that has its own risks. Youth camp. I mean, it has because of the very unique for young people that are experiencing homelessness. And it's just the support that people need at that time in their life is not about a building or not about a meal. It's some compassion there that's needed. And I don't think that's government's role, but I think it's kind of for us to make a place for those that do that work to do that work. Yeah, I think that. Um... I think our youth, when they're down and out, if they know that our community cares and has, has a place, at least a safety valve for them to, to eat, <laughs> rest, food, warmth, um, I, I, I'm sure it will help them and, and, uh, and hopefully help them bridge whatever kind of challenges are he uh, they're facing. <laughs> I'm just, there's um, some programs and I think Shauna because there's several youth programs that were in the process together that are involved in Salem, Eugene, Portland, and a couple communities along the coast that were working on grants to do some outreach for targeting 16 to 25 year olds in particular, because that's a severe at-risk group that parents seem to think that they're done at that age and they just kick them to the street and the kids don't have the skills or the ability or the support to get that done. And so there's a special mission that was working on this a couple years ago. And I, Shauna would know better than me because she was, she holds um, 
family sessions and listening sessions at the rec center that she would probably know more about which who's doing what and um, public health has been doing some outreach in that regard as well. So there's a lot of things. And then there was um, a group, there's like five or six churches in town that were doing outreach with meals. And I know that um, the Lutheran church is getting ready to start back up with meals. Mm -hmm. um, so there's things that are out there that have been kind of in quiet because of COVID that, you know, if you know somebody in the system, they're going to go, oh yeah, these people do that. And these people do that. And I think getting all those resources in one place because the directory that used to exist is like kind of melted into thin air. But the kind of the big thing is people finding anything in St. Helens because we don't have the connectivity to allow that to happen. You know, just the one only concern I had out of your list is, you know, people think having ID Vehicle registration is automatic, but when people don't have a roof over their head, kind of the last thing they're spending their money on. So it's just going to be interesting what the attorney says, what we can realistically require. Um, Rachel Barry has the list of um, nonprofits of folks. So if you want to connect with her, um, she's in charge of trying to arrange for these task force meetings. And I, we kind of had a structure. So if you have some suggestions, uh, she'd probably be the one to talk to. And do you meet with her separate from this group, or does she report to this group? Or are you so the reportee? For this it's, group? it's coming together. And so initially, the thought is we would have the task force meet potentially one on one, but we could also have a big group meeting. But I think the idea is to allow each agency specifically to provide its input and then we it's kind of like a drawing board thing you know and and you know it goes into time place and manner and okay where are the homeless and okay what do we do and how do we how do we structure these things with these time place and manner restrictions uh, you know uh, and and so the, to get the input from the various groups so i think initially they were going to be individual meetings, um, but I don't know how time consuming it's going to be. I know I'm willing to put a lot more time into it. And um, uh, and and then there was going to be a group meeting, but I, I would talk to Rachel and it, I mean, you know, there's no the, firm decision yet about the it. The bigger the meeting, the longer the meeting. So more people there is the longer it'll go. But um, I just meant like anything that you find just for me, even though Jennifer says I can't do that right now or you know, um, Dan, I think that for me, I would like whether it's a little blurb or whether it's the sheet of the nonprofits, just the list, that if it could be included in the packet, like here's an update. So then people can I don't think they can do that because we, before there was an issue with you can't have Steve, the packet. Now Steve's sending out on the subcommittee information to everybody. Didn't we have that issue? That it's if you reply all. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. It's like we would have a dialogue. I meant just like this, what we're working on. So, if we had a question, we could bring it up in the meeting. Yeah, there's a difference in sending information out versus replying and having a conversation about it via email. Is that not text part? <laughs> well, it's, it's a quorum, yeah, yeah, the, which yeah. needs to be in a public meeting. Right. Yeah. No, I just think that for me, I like to look at the stuff ahead of time. And to Dan's point about rehashing, 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 if everybody got your stuff ahead of time, there would, you could circle it and mark it up. Because I know I've seen plenty like, commissioners mark it up, write their questions, and then we could just go through, you know, and just go through your items. Oh, everybody's looked at the packet. Oh, okay. And you'd give us a brief summary, and then we'd be like, I had a question regarding this, or I had a question regarding that, or good job, way to go, good progress, or whatever. Because somebody in this group might know somebody or might have heard something that can help out the process. So even though we're not all going to be on the committee, we could all be supportive of the committee. So you know, what I, what I bring to the committee is the legal side and and the anticipation and, and anticipation of litigation and the defense of our plan in right. court. Um, and I, I don't know a lot about what services are there and how. They're delivered, and I think getting as much information in that regard and how we can best facilitate our service providers with our plans is you know, so. I you know so I think trying to get communication from these service providers. Right. This is what we do. 
oh, you're thinking about having camps. Okay, this is what's going to work. This is what isn't going to work. Uh, you know, you see how the right. thinking is. Maybe we would have different types of. Uh, you know, some of the stuff I've learned through looking at YouTube's about you know, people say, "Why do you keep coming back to this spot after the city clears you out?" And it's because it's safe. I feel like I I can be here and not be right. attacked. And so I think safety is a big key for uh, a lot of people. I think they would prefer to be in a safe camp rather than out in the forest if they feel like they had a legal place they could lay their head. Uh, that's just one point. So um, I do think we need to get information in an efficient way so what we do create is going to be as helpful as possible and uh, as humane as possible. So we should probably formalize um, the Planning Commission's representation on the task force um, via motion. I nominate Toski. Uh, do you really want to be on this task force thing? I don't know. Or can we just go with me, uh, Jenny, and uh, Kasner? Can only be three. Yeah. Okay, so I nominate Toski. Uh, uh, Jenny Carlson and Charles Kasner for the uh, task force. Second that. Paul Peter. Aye. Aye. And then, Russ, do you want to hang in there with the, the, the subcommittee or do you, you want to? Okay. All right. Uh, okay. All right. And the subcommittee is separate. Mm -hmm. The subcommittee is separate. So that's our subcommittee. We meet as the Planning Commission subcommittee. So Jennifer has, are you stepping away from it? Okay, so. Um, how is the subcommittee different than this task force? The, the subcommittee is kind of behind the scenes. Three, no more than three planning commissioners get there together to brainstorm. The task force is this broader group We're community members and other agencies and such. Trying to yeah. get the definitions on the line of no. so the subcommittee really quite the task force. Me too. Yeah the subcommittee um basically tries to organize the planning commission's involvement and comes up with strategy and then you know, what are we going to come back to the planning commission with? What are ideas that the what are ideas that the subcommittee wants to bring back? Presents to the planning commission and says, looks for approval from the planning commission for subcommittee action. Um, you know, my task or our task was to come back and report the meetings. The meeting started, but then the city got involved. So that and so that's the. That's the subcommittee. We communicate by email, uh, kind of talk among each other and figure out, you know, brainstorm, that kind of thing. It's, it seems like the subcommittee task was to get the city uh, going on this on this effort. And now they've got a task force, so subcommittee's kind of done their job. That's what I'm saying. That was the point I was trying yeah, to make. And so <laughs> let them go and work on something else. Uh yeah, I'm not willing to get to get my hands off of this one because I'm saying you're off of it. You're still on the sub, you're still on the task force. I think the planning commission needs to continue with this proactive item until the end. And uh and, and I see the planning commission actually coming forward with potentially holding public hearings, um, holding the holding evidentiary hearings. Uh I, I don't want to let it go yet. I mean, at some point I could see in the process saying, yeah, we don't really need to be making decisions, but I, I could see us, I could see our attorney saying, yeah, that would be really helpful for the planning commission to hold hearings, for example, on some subject, we put out public notice, we hold hearings, we make findings. If the city council uh, controls the task force, why would the city council be done it better? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure who controls the task force at this point because we're a collaborative task force and it was it, it was chartered by the city council, correct? Right? Right. No, it was it's in a joint meeting and, okay. and and I think it's a joint planning commission city council task force. Okay. Yeah. And okay. I and here's, here's my follow-up question. If it's a joint effort, does it include 
Mr. Gunderson? Well, that's a good question. Again, welcome aboard. So <laughs> in the discussion we had before, um, Councillor uh, Berkeley was part of that discussion. And at the time, you know, he wasn't sure that the mayor was going to shake things up, which was kind of a new thing um, to shake things up after a short amount of time. And so the assumption is that he would be the person by default, um, but obviously the default has changed. And I'm the default. You are the default. Baseline. So oh, what are you asking? Am I going to be part of the task force? I think that's the question. I I, my question is, is in, as your role as liaison, um, do you supervise or liaison every activity of this body? So if three members of this body go to the task force, do you also go and you're not part of the quorum then, but you would vote there? So that's what I'm just trying to figure out. Is is it three, three, or is it three plus one? Does it have to be plus one? You know, it's, I'm just trying to make sure. It's tough decision because you're just new. It, you don't know anything, right? <laughs> I think it's a question for the council to figure right. out. It was more for staff to get a little bit refined definition of who they expect because council has its own demands on it. Um, you know, day meetings, night meetings, and backup work, and being a new counselor stuff on it on its own. First two years, I was like a zombie, but um, you know, so whether they want to commit your time to that or they have other plans for you. And 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 Patrick said he was willing when we discussed, and so that was the assumed default. Yes, it's a total new thing. We're not putting, trying to put you on the spot, but it's certainly a discussion. Yeah, I, just, I don't want to unincluded. Yeah. Well, I think Patrick, uh, the way that it was handled is that we were having a meeting. Uh, Patrick um, somehow found out about it, and he said he wanted to participate. He came into one meeting, um, and then uh, now we have a changing of the guard. And so I... I don't think there was anything official, so I think Councillor Gunderson could decide how he wants to handle it. Um, this is going to come before the city eventually, and I think the, you, know, you may want to get involved and want to hear. You may want, you know, it's really up to you. Uh, it's not a requirement. We'd love to have you. Um, no, I, I think I think I think it's a good point. I think uh, I think I would. I think I would like to be a part of that. Part of which task force or the. Just yeah, the task force. I want to see what what, what your what your you know, what the attorneys are saying, what you guys are you know formulating as a plan, how it's going to look, you know, and then I can bring that back to the city council as well as you guys. But I, I would like to 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 be in on it, um, and just kind of see which direction it's headed because right now it's in its infancy, right? We don't even know what's going on, really, other than we've been tasked with providing shelter for somebody somewhere, somehow, right? Yeah. Giving them the option for that. Um, and so, yeah, I would be interested in that. Okay, so- uh, Whatever capacity that is, it doesn't mean that I have to, it, however you see that it would fit best in with what you guys are doing. I don't want to interfere with what you're doing. The, I get that. Um, the meeting with the council is tomorrow at 11. Um, my, it's not for the whole task force. No, this is this is just a few people. Right. And, which, by the way, I have, on my calendar, I wrote down 1 o'clock. 1, uh, I'm not sure. Let's double check. And if I have to get my dad from a hospital, that's going to have to be the priority. So can't. Uh, really? Yeah. So I, it's bad timing. So I, uh, I, we'll report back. I want to be there. Yeah, I've got it. At, I've got it at one o'clock Pacific, four o'clock Eastern. All right, one o'clock. Okay. Does so it's up to you whether you want to tune in on that meeting and listen to the discussion with council. I and, and you may want to check. I can, but I'm not sure, sure that with what's going on. It's okay. So it's, Probably yeah. will be. It's fine. I don't know how you. It's kind of a small group. Yeah. Well, in council, we'll... not the whole task force will be meeting with council. Yeah. I'll, I'll let my Early boss on a process. You know, you I, not everybody was here. Some people were here when we were deciding the rules around another activity to come to our community. We made rules about things we didn't want it by and things we did want it by. And um, Jacob made this amazing map with little circles. 
You remember that? It's like if this equivalent was a thousand miles this, or a thousand feet, this is if it's 2,000 feet. So we did schools and different things, and then we decided, and that's what I think is if Jacob can't make the heating, it'd be cool to have kind of a never, never ever here, never ever here, or if you have to here, if you have to here. Yeah, this is this is that's way down the road. This is down the road. This is an initial discussion. Okay. And even the yeah, this is an initial discussion. Because I think I would feel just from my standpoint is to have rules and criteria and apply them objectively. I think when we start talking about place, that's when we get back to the map. It works and, like planning commissions usually work as rules yeah. and implement them as opposed to not next to not in my backyard. But in their backyard, that kind of thing. So if you have those rules that are safe in there, yeah. that's all. <clears throat> Next. So is that meeting tomorrow? Zoom meeting. Pardon? Yes, Zoom meeting. Zoom meeting. Okay. Do I have the invite for that? Um, uh, I don't think any counselor does. Is there a standard? And I don't think that was an intent. This is just to. You have, we have an attorney with the initial discussion to think about it. It's not a task for I think it'd be good no, for you to listen. I think um, we can let John Walsh John Walsh know if you if you are interested. It's the first yeah, I could probably do some. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I think it'd be good for you to kind of hear because uh, yeah, I, no, I agree. I agree. So uh, we'll get you a link. Yeah, perfect. I'll just forward to you now. That's fine. So, uh, is your presentation um, updates? That's a three one one five. Pretty much there. Are you there? Well, I think at some point we'll move on to the discussion points. Yeah, that's it for the HP three one five. We can we can discuss later all those. I think at some point we will be discussing those places, etc. We don't have to do it tonight. Okay. Who thought? Right. Well, we can be right back. Yeah. Later. Yeah. The new ones, I think I think your email is about to come out. I think you're about to get a CD. I've got one. So oh, you do. So I'm going to send that. Whatever the common one, the one they changed it to. Oh, sorry, yeah. Well, straight down. Yeah. Got the rhythm down there on the cops leg. Mm -hmm. So they started coming in more straight there. Let's go. And then, you know, the Shemir, she battled with the female girl. Right. One right across from what I Yeah, right. Vandalism? Yeah. Well, why not? Yeah. Look at the rollers, and of course, they have to do the conference. That's in there. Yes. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. they um, yeah. mm -hmm. they had a hole through the metal. It's a good reminder. It's not muted in your live, just so you know. It does pick up voices. Good. Yeah. That was good. So, that was not that I didn't overhear anything you were saying, but I just wanted to remind oh, everybody. Can they see your hands? Big brother's watching him. Well, the person I took to the emergency room um, is deaf, so she's doing it. I'm a 
language is barely written in sign language to interpret. It's barely. I watch a lot of meetings from home, a lot of their city council meetings. So, yeah, it sounds all broken up like snippets of them on YouTube. Yeah, you watch them on YouTube. Yeah, that's a little difficult to understand. Yeah. I don't know if you can use it, but it's still down to the train. It just makes me think of any issues. Would you recommend that we talk a little bit louder? Louder, maybe. I mean, it's zero. I don't necessarily watch us, but I watch city council. I watch all the work sessions and all the same sound equipment. Yeah. They've upgraded. They've upgraded and upgraded and upgraded. What we, the findings that we found is, People not enunciating, people looking in the other direction, and people talking to each other. And even sitting out there. Yeah. Sometimes if you're in the back, it's like, you know, man, it's like. Who's <laughs> next? What? Can you hear us? Um, we could go on to this new proactive item proposals uh, for okay, in your packet with a cover letter from Jacob. Excuse me, one of the so there's um you do you mind um having doing an introduction? Yeah, sure. Uh, these are these these proactive items he's throwing out, but yeah, these these are all important. Sorry, this is an important input, I think. Talking about talking over each other. <laughs> um so yeah, these were all submitted by uh Commissioner Toski in, in November. Um both Jenny and I reviewed them, provided some comments. I provided the original and then the commented version, um, original commented version. So it's a hopefully a logical order. Um, so you can see some of the staff comments. Uh, these are rules that you created, they're your rules. Um, but there's two things I think just we should discuss um, because they're new. Um, one is that all of the proposals were emailed to everybody instead of just staff. The rules suggest it's just staff. Um, so that was just a question um, whether or not we care about that or not. Um, like I said, they're your rules. And then the, the other question is, is about the rules more specifically. And the reason I'm bringing this up is the genesis of these rules was jurisdiction that was kind of the this whole initial debate on well is this something that the planning commission should do and i'm not picking on any particular item just when this concept came up um in the earlier half of last year well let's have rules so we can talk about jurisdiction and um there's a there's a question I, i'm not sure if that is addressed that well at least there's there's no specificity uh, and because it's so paramount to why we have these rules and would help shape how you look at the items you know there's a you know should that be beefed up now should it be beefed up later that's kind of the second question and you know getting into the staff comments on those particular items we can you know once we get to each item we can talk about that depending on the discussion uh, but i i thought those were two initial things worth talking about before we uh, start digging deeper i think it's hard to make a decision on a proactive item if we don't have some background somewhere on it so i think it's helpful that we got this ahead of time in our packet so we knew what the request was, and um, it, it gave me time at least to prepare whether I was for it or against it, or it just happened in here. <laughs> I think that's a short amount of time to try to make a new decision. What you were, what you were thinking of that the, I, I don't know the rules in front of me, but there, there are two. Present to the staff to get make sure it's something that could even be presented to the planning commission. Is that what the um, idea? Well, and it's and I mean it's to make sure that um, 
that there's content on certain things like jurisdiction, for example, right. the determination of jurisdiction, you know, that's up to you. That's part of the discussion. Um, in, in my, well, in staff review of the uh, submittals, the jurisdiction, it was kind of the, the same comment for all of them. Um, and I didn't feel like it really, really got to give you the roadmap to how it connects to the code. So you, did, does that mean you would have hoped that that uh, Commissioner Toski um, or, her, or whoever um, gives you a proactive item First, you give this input, they get it, and then they maybe give it back to you with with those answers addressed before bringing it to the planning commission. Is that what you're hoping for that you're thinking of to fit the rules? Um well the because we're talking about jurisdiction, like I said, that's what created the rules. Yeah. And it's, like I said, it doesn't give you that specific direction. And so if the jurisdiction is nebulous, and that's one of the key factors that you're supposed to consider in determining an item, it seems like there's a, mission, a missing discussion point. You want me to address that? Yeah, go ahead. So, being an attorney, <laughs> being an attorney uh, licensed in two states um, and having gone through law school and uh, litigating before the court, uh, jurisdiction is something that um, <laughs> is something that uh, con the concept of jurisdiction is something I'm pretty familiar with. And we are a judicial body as well as a planning commission body. And basically, the court can decide whether it has jurisdiction over something. Um, and usually, the way that court, uh, which we are a judicial body, uh, decide whether it has jurisdiction is on many different grounds. So it's not just one ground, it could be a whole bunch of different grounds. Um, and I did not write the law concerning the powers and the duties of the planning commission. These, our powers and duties are extremely broad and extremely powerful. And, and so the reason why I included so many different uh, items of jurisdiction is to demonstrate that um, we have jurisdiction on many different grounds to take up uh, the proposed uh, items. So for example, uh, the planning commission plans for architectural standards and historic preservation, right? And you, know, you made the comment that should be broken down into two. So let's just take up architectural standards. Um, what architectural standards should there be in the city? Should there be architectural standards? We don't care about architectural standards. But that's not jurisdiction. You're getting into reasons. Well, but can we even take up the subject? In other words, can we develop codes that say when you build something within the city, it needs to have these characteristics? Um, trim, uh, eight by eight posts, uh, be at least 10 feet high. I mean, there are, you, you can go on and on about what an architectural standard could be. Uh, the question is, do we have jurisdiction to, to plan, um, to plan that type of detail and then to propose codes? Um, and, and so, for example, we have an overall goal of economic prosperity and economic development of the city. Maybe you want architectural standards to make sure that when buildings are built here, they look nice. 
Otherwise, somebody can just build whatever they want, wherever they want. And so what we would do is we would look at what are the standards that are already in place? And maybe what we want to do is we want to make sure that when things are built, they look a certain way. Um, we I hear people say, oh, I really love the way this town looks. What's one of those towns that you told me about, Russ? Leverworth, Solvang. Leverworth, Solvang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, they obviously have architectural standards in these places because when they build them, they actually have a look to the town. When I when I go on the river and I look at St. Helens and I look at our city, St. Helens has a look. Um, it's a look that comes from history. It's a look from the town that it was built. So the question is, is, you know, me as a planning commissioner, I think, you know, I think St. Helens should preserve that look. I think St. Helens should require that when you put up siding on your building, you should have at least six inch trim. It should look a certain way so that our town has continuity. That's my idea. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, no, let, I, me, let, me, let me go on then. Okay. So architectural standards, jurisdiction, the planning commission has jurisdiction. We have powers and duties. Our, we have the duty and the power to conduct studies appropriate to an understanding of area of development and its significant public interest. Okay, well, um, you know, we'd like to develop these 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 things so they look good. Uh, and is it in the public interest that it looks good? It, does that help our economic development? Develop and maintain comprehensive plan proposals for recommendations, to city council. Now you criticize that saying that's not a comprehensive plan, Jacob. My point was we don't have any plans. So no, 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 no. I'm saying you are trying to implement the comprehensive plan. You're saying you're saying you're trying to create a comprehensive plan. It's implementation. So then if you're doing that, then what specific standards in the comprehensive plan do you point to? And and why on each of them under jurisdiction you list all the powers and duties rather than the specific ones. Now, I understand that you did a standpoint, but what about your fellow commissioners? If you if you specify the specific ones, it's going to help these people comprehend it. This exercise is not a judicial review. It's to help your team. No, no, this is a judicial review because if at anybody at any time questions whether we had jurisdiction to take this up in the first place, we can say we have jurisdiction. I, I could say this, that I put every single reason why we have jurisdiction. I figure somebody one day may challenge us. I hear people say this all the time. Do we have jurisdiction to do that? I say, absolutely we do. And here's the letter of the law. So if somebody wants to challenge the jurisdiction of the planning commission to, to study and propose architectural standards, then I challenge them to say why we don't. When I have quoted uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten sections of our law that allows us to do it, but you've cited the, all those for each of them. It's, it's the same. It's it's the same under jurisdiction. It's cut and paste. We have jurisdiction. So this is how courts operate. Courts operate by saying why all the reasons they have jurisdiction. They don't go one. And I and and you know maybe I would put number one down and somebody would argue with me and say, well, number one really doesn't apply. I put them all down because I think we have jurisdiction going away on all of these items. Yeah, I, I think that's where we're disagreeing in that treating this at this juncture as a judicial proceeding rather than a document to help your team team out. Actually, what occurred during our HB 3115 discussion is I said that we had jurisdiction to study HB 3115 to be involved in. We had a right. We had a right to look into it. We have powers to look into things. Once we decide we have jurisdiction, we can look at the, our powers. It doesn't have any limitation on our powers at all on how we can go about doing it. And so I'm not, I'm, I am here to set forth in a legal document when we decide to take up a planning item all of the reasons why we have the power to do it. And, and so, Mike, you, know, you don't like the style of it. Um, I think we're better to be inclusive than not inclusive. Not one person has come and said, I'm confused by this. 
how is it that um, recommendations to the city council plans for regulation of the future growth of the city and beautification of the city in respect to its public and sure. private buildings, work streets, <coughs> park grounds? This is the first time the group's reviewing it. Why would they come to you prior to that and tell you it's confusing? This is the first time it's going before the body. Okay, well, let, let me need some deep breaths. You, you said it's irrelevant, but let's make sure. Let, I just picked this one at random. Recommend to the city council plans for regulations of future growth of the city and beautification of the city in respect to its public and private buildings. So what our duty is to make recommendations to the city for the beautification of our public buildings. And that means architectural standards. We want our city to look beautiful. We are trying to make our city better with everything we do. That is our duty. We have jurisdiction to do it. It's in our law. Do you want me to give another example? So that's why we're going to do it, because it's our duty to do it. That when I see buildings going up that look like crud, frankly, I got to think that we could do a better job. And so that's me. So I'm coming to our planning commission folks and I'm saying, hey, do you guys think we should develop some architectural standards that we should make our beautification of our, of our we can make our economic standards higher. We should make our beautification higher. We should have standards that when somebody builds a building, that it actually looks nice, that it has certain elements that make St. Helens look good. I've been out on the river. You you had a Jennifer Pugsley has a has a has a, a drone that she flies over. You can see how things look. So I don't see any reason to limit our jurisdiction at all. In fact, every sentence in here not only says that we that we can do it, it says that we should be doing it. It's our job to do it. And that that's what we should be working on as a priority for the betterment of all of the citizens of this city. So that's why it's in there. Because to show that not only is, can we do it, we should do it. And we have the power to do it. So if anybody says, why are you guys going to architectural standards? Say the law says we have to. That's our job. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any, any debate on that since the Planning Commission has done that before. Okay. So that's why I have all these things on there. If I thought it was just one sentence, I would have just put one in there. But I put in all of them. Because I want to make sure that I'm not suggesting things that I think that we don't have absolute duty and power to get involved in. And we should be taking the time to do it. And frankly, the things that I suggested, I think are things that need to be a priority with this city. I think this city needs to continue to move forward in the direction it's headed. And there are a lot of forces trying to go the other way. And there are a lot of people that uh, frankly are going to do anything they want to do. And if we don't put laws on them, they're going to continue to do what they do. So that's my opinion. I'm a planning commissioner. I brought it to this body for discussion. Now, after we discuss this, people will say, yeah, we don't care about it. Okay, we'll move on to the next item. That's me. And, and uh, Ms. Carlson, she says she's got a lot of things that are important to her. Well, she can bring it up. She can well, write the jurisdiction. Up street standards and architectural standards right here. Violence. So Try it again. Try it again. Try it again. Bring it up. Look at our procedural guidelines. And yeah, there's an outline. There's street standards now. Or with some streets. Yeah, I just I just know that it was not popular with the council when I when I brought it up. Well, maybe it'll be popular with the planning commission. We can we can make some suggestions to council, and then we can bring it forward, and they can be holes in it, or they can say, "Hey, that's a great idea." I mean, no, nobody's saying it's a bad idea. I don't blame anybody here. Doesn't want. I mean, there's a fine line between doing what you want with your own property and degrading the neighborhood. So, you know, that's this group's job is to navigate that. Thank you. That path. I agree. So, so does that answer the question on the jurisdictional set segments? Um, do you think we don't have jurisdiction to look into architectural standards and to try to 
come up with at least suggestions for architectural standards? And you think we don't have jurisdiction to do that? No. Not to just do, not to recommend. There you yes. go. Yeah. Are we working through this as a body of four recommendations? Or I, I wasn't even, I was being very general. I wasn't getting into the, personally, to, to the specific ones. How are we approaching this? There's four different. You know, well, my vote is we do it next meeting. We read it, come back, and we discuss it. You, you're you bringing it to the planning commission to what is considered for proactive items. That's right? true. It's late it's, in the night. We just consider them next time. Do you want to? It's up to you. Okay. You're the one that's you're the one that's offering offering the ideas. If I'm you, prepared if you want a few slides for architectural standards. We can do it tonight, or we can do it. No, I I think let's just start with one, and then I didn't, you know, yeah, I didn't know if we're gonna go through this as a group. yeah. It's a, 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 a lot packed here. Yeah. So yeah, let's do let's just so like that. Yeah, if we tackled all of them, we'd probably be looking at two more hours, I would guess. Yeah. All right. So let's start with one, which is the architectural standards one. Okay. So my first my first gut feeling was um my my mother and father lived in a neighborhood with CCNRs. Uh, it was such a pain in the butt. But it feels like that. So I want to make sure that it doesn't feel like that to the city that we've got to have. You know, these color are browns, and that's it. That's all the only colors you can paint in your house. <coughs> that's an education case for people, though, because I can drive you through neighborhoods that don't have CCNRs and they all look like crap. And I'll drive you through ones that do have CCNRs and they're all. Uh, they you look like crap, too. <laughs> Some of them, too. But <laughs> I have yeah. certain things in mind when I mean by these standards. You know, you know, and so you're going to hear what I have in mind, yeah. and you can shoot it down, but I. I have things in mind, but this so was just really to take up whether we want to do it. It's, so. a, it's a sad state of affairs when the planning department can recognize a builder by a picture of the building. And so there are certain builders that build really nice looking things that fit the neighborhood. And there are certain builders that cut every corner. And you can't pick and choose that way, but by having architectural standards, you hold everybody to the same bar. And it shouldn't be you know, the honor system of building a decent house or a decent business, it should be, everybody should aspire to build a decent house or build a decent building. Well, the neighbors are all happy to have on their street. I think I have a proposal that maybe takes a little bit of baby steps in this. That'd be perfect. Uh, well, I question, like you I said, like that's that. a question too big. You like, oh, I've downsized the question <laughs> a bit. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you have slides? You have to pull them up to pictures? Yes, I love pictures. And it's four <laughs> slides. Yeah. <laughs> There's less interpretation than there. Yeah. And I have to say, this this is the, the subject matter that I'm very fond of talking about. So, I mean, I'm really not excited that we're, we can allow manufactured homes in any lot in St. Helens, right? Yeah. Single wise, no. Uh, that's where's our architectural standards for our manufactured home? Well, and that's, that's part of the discussion. Yeah. I mean, objective standards and all those things that, that we law, have right? to deal with now with state law, yeah. Yeah, this you can put all, all, all the architectural standards on you want, you still get a manufacturer on in there. Anyway. So this was in my response to Commissioner Toshke's um, suggestion of taking up architectural standard and work preservation. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Honesty Hill before, but it's actually south first. It starts with uh, the Samuel Miles house, which is the big yellow house on First Street, mm -hmm. and moves up to these different houses, the Dart House, um, Frank George House, Cliff Ross House, the W.B. Dillard House, uh, built in 1896, was demolished quite a few years ago. That's now a building site. Um, but you go, you go on and on here with the Orrin Shepherd House, 1926, the Gray House, 1925. It's a pretty significant house. In fact, Commissioner Kassner lives on that street. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a showcase. It's a special place. Um, but what has happened, because here's the big thing I don't understand. You see the hash marks. That's where we get to make are tasked to make decisions on architectural standards. I do not understand why those hash marks don't cover the entire historic, historic district. district. Why does it stop in the, in the 
commercial core. Why do we care about uh, behind John Gum? You see those yellow boxes. Why do we care about the Hatton House that's situated there, but we don't care about the Ross House, which is uh, along no. the other end? That's <laughs> the of the city. Yeah, I mean, it's like why, why do, why is it structured that way? And so my solution would be to um, change that and to within that district. Um, implement architectural standards that are set by the Secretary of Interior, something they're already doing. And this may not go broad enough for everybody to blanket the city with architectural standards, but I think this is a good solution and baby steps to figure out how, we're, how we approach it. Um, across the street, like I said, the Edwin Ross House, the Shin House, which is the really interesting looking house on First Street overlooking the river. It's special to me because the Shins, I believe, built it in Plaza Square. Um, but so you see a significant list of significant homes. If you want to go to the next slide. And here's pictures of them. I took them on a rainy day. <laughs> it starts the Miles House and goes to the Dart House and, and different houses. This black and white picture was the Dillard House, W.B. Dillard House that was demolished. And you see now what they're building because there are no architectural standards. That's what's being built. Mm -hmm. On the two front lots that are overlooking your, the river, you see that giant garage, two car garage, and that little tiny window overlooking the river. And it's like playing that old game of what doesn't belong, right? <laughs> what's similar and what doesn't belong, and it's obvious. Mm -hmm. On the back side of the Dillard House, they're building four townhomes, and they're the sound, same townhomes that developers built all over the historic district on 2nd Street. All those skinny lots, you see those ugly townhomes that, in my opinion, in 20 years are going to be blight. The one on the corner of 2nd and Old Portland Road, the fence is already falling down. I mean, there's concrete everywhere, cars parked everywhere. It's not what belongs in the historic district. So why don't we include architectural standards for the entire district? And there, there, there was an attempt. I have this um, article from uh, the Chronicle, December 22nd, 2010, where it was attempted and uh, rejected, uh, rejected significantly. And that was to expand architectural review in the entire downtown district. Well, I think it's because people aren't educated. There's an organization called Restore Oregon that already has a curriculum that we could present to property owners to show that it's not a scary thing. It's like you said, I don't want, we're not saying that you can't paint your house brown now. Maybe that's not part of the architectural standards, but certainly we could do better than that. Yeah, I think that's the straw that broke the camel's back a little bit. I mean, drive down 2nd Street, all those little skinny lots, they all have those same townhomes. Terrible. And <laughs> they're terrible. And um, just a comment on that. I don't want to disparage, but I'm just shocked that somebody would take a new lot two blocks from the river and build that kind of a design. It just is stunning to me that I talk about a lost opportunity of building a beautiful home that has river views and um, and, and really could complement the skyline of our city. Instead, literally, there is a tiny window that looks out the front of the house. I don't think you'd see the river you wanted to out of that. And I, I, I to me, I look at that house as uh, eventual tear down. Somebody's gonna look at that, tear it down, and build what should be built there. I mean, that's 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 something where I think Ms. Carlson said. Well, what is it? <laughs> People are going to do with it. Unless you tell them what to do, they're going to do what they want to do kind of thing. I think they're developers that just look at the dollars. They don't care about the city and they don't live here. Yeah, they don't. For them, we need loss. That's that's the thing. So if you go up Knob Hill, the potential of the same scenario may happen. The roof that you see on the right-hand side of the house is the McCormick house. Um, the McCormicks were instrumental in this town. The story goes that he would sit in his bedroom and he has these little windows that would overlook look the shipyards and he could stand there in his bedroom in his bathroom and look out and say, hey, Joe's not doing his job, get to it. Um, 
And there's two lots that are vacant next to, those are outside the district even though, so I'm not sure the solution, but those are two lots that are owned by a builder, not the same builder, but the same situation is gonna happen on that end of the district. The old depression, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just for reference, they are outside the district. I'm glad you mentioned that. They are right, right. Yeah. just outside here in the district boundary. Um, and this this district boundary was set in 1984 when our historic district was founded and accepted. So they're the riverfront district. So the little um, black houses that you see are the designated landmarks, and you see on. On Honesty Hill on uh, First Street there, where he's building, where those two asterisks are, it's surrounded by landmarks. Those are all city landmarks. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just... It affects the property value. Absolutely. Of the absolutely. Yeah, and, and it comes back to, you know, what we're talking about and what our powers and duties are. Just to kind of throw this out there that, you know, our powers and duties are about beautification of the city. Economic you know, uh, prosperity. Um, and so I just think that having some guidance that uh, would be very helpful in maintaining our, you know, the riverfront is, is uh, all of the town is wonderful. It's a wonderful place to live no matter where you live. But preserving the look of the city, especially in the riverfront area, is, in my opinion, critical. So just to wrapping it up, it's um, our goals are to extend or amend the riverfront district. Um, you know what it says underneath that picture? <laughs> oh, boundary. <laughs> boundary to include the entire riverfront historic district and the riverfront redevelopment, because we need to think about that. What do we want that to look like? There are broad. Um, standards that are set for the new riverfront development, but I don't think we want to have the old side of the tracks and the new side of the tracks. <laughs> it's important that it's all seamless. I mean, these are historical assets for the city. Um, if we decide to take this up, you know, there's there's figures that show that <laughs> what preservation does for jobs, you know, for the trades that are specialized in restoration. And um, there's a lot of places we can go with that. There's only been one property that's been added to the designated landmark since 1984, and that was the Italianate Cottage, the Ibister House, which we added last year, didn't we? Yeah. Two years ago. Two years ago now. Yeah, I was still I was still counselor when we did work on that. But the incentives for that were adopted several years earlier. So I mean, and there's some well, things we need to work out, like on policing. They're still using camping in a camper and using a porta potty and it's not looking pretty, but so we need to figure out those. That's a that's an improvement issue, right? And then um, we need to advise city council regarding ideas and incentivizing property owners to restore, rehabilitate, and preserve properties within the new district. And that could be things like uh, fee waivers, or I mean, it's much more expensive to, um, as I currently know, and Mr. Foskey knows, it's much more expensive to rehabilitate and restore than to tear down and start new. But those two, so. Um, it's getting to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think there's ways we can incentivize that. And then the final piece is educating the public. And like I said, Restore Org already has their curriculum prepared to go out to cities. They may come out and even and speak to it. Um, so that's not so scary. <laughs> I had wondered because um, Jacob and I went to a Main Street slash historic preservation thing early on in my tenure at council. And they talked about, it was some guy from this old house. One of those people came out and talked about how the fastest growing thing in landfills is to, you know, replaceable house parts. And now original and historic homes don't have replaceable house parts. They have There's more, more vinyl windows in the landfill than diapers. Right. And so I think about stuff like that about having a class. And I wonder now that we have the rec program and I'm just always thinking about adult programming. If people offered a class on how to fix your own window, how to hang a screen door properly, some people would know how to fix their own house. I mean, I would go to that kind of stuff. There's nothing out here like that. And I think there's a real proactive role that the community can take on education and providing that information. So people can pick up 
except the how old house they have because they you know whatever whether it's they want to store a home or they can't afford to build new or whatever you know i think it's a good education i think it's good on a lot of different levels i obviously support commissioner toski's <laughs> proposal to take Thanks this on as a uh, proactive item i like it in the back size pictures <laughs> i second now, the, the rules you created says you're supposed to talk about jurisdiction, reasons, and um, level of staff involvement and monetary expense resources. Well, I think clearly the jurisdiction, we're already making these decisions, and that's the other hat we wear. Standards, so. um, you know, I is it going to take a lot of staff time? I mean, right now, the proposal is really let's take this up and initially first step, just extend the hash marks into the. Well, we need to just we need to discuss this stuff. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, no we need to discuss this stuff, how it works. One, you take it on, then we talk about scope, desires, then we start whittling it down. Because um, some of the. Some of the stuff isn't going to work for the other things, and we could get into that. Um, How much staff time do you think we want to take up architect? Uh, just, uh, you know, I want to take up trims, styles, and other stuff. And uh, I mean, but how much staff time? you think it's going to take to take on this? Well, I, there's there's a lot of discussion and details to cover. And that's going to help influence the amount of staff time necessary. Years years ago, when we were talking about this, we were talking about it as simple as making sure single family dwellings with walls facing streets have windows. It's that simple. So it was a blazing requirement. Um, so, and that could be that could be fairly simple. Um, you do some research, you look at some jurisdictions, uh, you have some ideas, we talk about those ideas, uh, maybe we have a public forum, we uh, write them up, adopt them, and that, you know, that may not be so bad, but as it gets more complicated, then, you know, the what, what are the goals become, it's, it just becomes a a Russian novel that you read in the winter as opposed to a comic book. So um, it's it's hard to answer that question until the, the, the agreed upon scope and scale, which would be a discussion after the commission determines that it's a proactive item and wants to take on, um, that discussion would have to happen then. Well, it sounds like depending on the scope of the different areas of architectural standards we want to take on, staff time can be managed um, if we go in little steps. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just a question of you know, let's go on right now, or you know, basically. Yeah. Well, it's like to me, we could be guided by the you know, the state historic preservation office. Like, what would they care about in within the district, kind of thing, and what. And, and so that, that I mean, guidance, you know, as not just saying, well, I don't like green houses, so I would propose that we don't have green houses. So that's that's the first question is, does everybody agree with focusing on that area? Because I've heard a lot of different things over the years. And I, I, I'm a big picture person. And, you know, I came at this not as much from the historic standpoint, because there is some critical mass out there from the historic, but from a Main Street standard. To look at supporting just things that shouldn't be on Main Street, things that if the building had standards, you wouldn't have a storage unit place on Main Street, you know, those mm -hmm. kind of things, just Main Street standards that it should look like from Highway 30 all the way through the new development that you have standards that would make it work for people that are going the extra mile with their development, as well as somebody that's just trying to squeeze as many dollars out of their dirt as they possibly can because it's like in the end in the long run we all benefit when you put the investment in up front 
So I'm just, I'm, you know, I, I like the idea of the historic district and by all means, every historic home should be captured. But it's like, if we're going to do this, I think that we need to look at a historic slash Main Street plan. Because it's like to, what I hear all over town is, everything's downtown, everything's downtown. What about the rest of this community? You know, I hear it from any business on Holton, any business down Columbia Boulevard. We don't even get mentioned. So we just want to have that. And Jacob and I have talked about um, the dairy village multiple times that anybody could come in and buy that and pull it. Right it should now. be a landmark. Yeah. And it's like there's just a lot of things that aren't necessarily 100 year old buildings, but are super important culturally to our community. Well, and the, it's not even 100 years, it's 50. Right. Is the, Right. But, but I think it's you're talking yeah. about our ancient. It's the <laughs> I think it's a different animal when you're looking at standards and they have a new subdivision of the right. world than you have living in the Right. That's what I'm talking about levels. There's yeah, so it's a puzzle. Here's here's a suggestion that uh, after further discussion and um, that we agree to take it on and that then we uh, do a the committee uh, where um we can talk about the different scope you know maybe doing this in steps and then the planning planning and then we can go to staff and say okay here's this piece and here's a bigger piece and then here's even a little bigger piece then we can kind of talk about staff can then give input the, the subcommittee can give input to staff ahead of the meeting try to get some input from staff on what it's going to take, and then we could decide, okay, which piece do we want to take on first? Because I think Jennifer has identified a defined area, and that I, I had a bigger scope in mind. Ginny has a bigger scope in mind, but if we maybe we go one step at a time. We'll draw the elephant. Well, you can tell us which different one things. Maybe it is historic preservation yeah. and oh, rust standards. standards. Yeah. So then that becomes, you know, how broad is your proactive item that you're picking? Yeah. Can we go. Is it the, save the world or is it six years small two plus two? I do think we're living in a different world in 2010 as far as the movement for historic preservation. Well, I, I think originally I thought we could pick a street and go from there to the river. Um, and then and so, it was yeah, I'm yeah, sorry, I agree with you. It, it was so close to the recession, there was a lot of slowdown, and I think that's part part of the 2010 discussion. You know, some people who are vocal at the time that don't even live here. Yeah. Yeah. Russ said he had wanted to say something. Oh, no, I just, I, I agree with uh, expanding it beyond the historic district. Uh, you know, those uh, those uh, duplexes we're talking about are going up all over the place. Yeah. And, and it needs to be rained in the uh, One thing I was thinking about, though, is, is there a community that's attractive that many of us have seen that we really like the looks of it? I don't know if they have standards written mm -hmm. and use that as a starting point and we can tweak something that's already developed. Yeah, this, yeah. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Well, yeah. I think there's lots of lots of communities that have standards. I've looked into um, independence. We can you know, they have a wonderful historic district and in fact they have two. Um, Albany, uh, King County and Seattle. Um, well for a long time independence had the uh, what did they call that building that was half built for owners. It was, mm -hmm. huge right it was an earlier yeah. failure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, they talked about that, and we went down and toured. Is it? Yeah, we went down and toured all that out. Mm -hmm. They had to build a lot of public trust after that failure because the Urban Renewal Agency spent a lot of money, no, nothing on return. Yeah. Just yeah. shell. Yeah. A skeleton of shell. Yeah. One thing I would yeah. at least story might be story. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I would I would consider because this was submitted as a package of stuff. And you know, do you want to think about everything before you say, okay, this is what we're going to commit ourselves to? Because uh, there are a lot of things there, and the discussions of other things could influence priorities. And I think this was a good start. Do you think we should rank them for the next meeting? What's our favorite? Uh, uh, What's I think favorite? we'll work on them all at the same time. But <laughs> I got Dan Carey in mind for this one. Mm -hmm. so budget, debt, gas, yes, facts, 
Yeah, remember the soda tax? That uh, went over our well. Yeah. Kind of All right, so uh, let me just kind of just go through real briefly. So, um, you know, I think understanding the budget is important. It's gonna, this one's going to be a lot of work, and it's probably going to take some time, but I, I do think that we need to uh, discuss at some point. Um, we've got a lot of infrastructure spending coming up, millions. Uh, and um, I think we're going to have to have some revenue production. I like the idea of a gas tax. Who yeah, has one? I know people are against it, but the thing is, is that we need money to make this city grow. Uh, uh, let's let's try and pitch it, get it on the ballot, see what people say. Also, I was thinking about a business license tax. Um, you know, I I have several rentals, um, uh, and and I pay a business license to rent my my. Uh, to the city of St. Helens, but I think it could be higher. I think that uh, we can not discuss all the other items. Just, yeah. just, all right, that's that. Okay, and then uh, let's see. Introduce okay, eliminate elimination of blight within the urban renewal zone. And so this is this is a discussion that I get from business owners saying, "Why is it that we can't? Well, why is it this Fat Boy's Pizza continue year in year out and nothing ever happens to it? The place is." Uh, you got that place over um, Grace's Annex. Uh, Grace's Annex. Um, there are several buildings, and so a business owner, we, we have we have several people that are putting significant millions of dollars into the city, and we have other people that are just dragging them down, and that and that is really kind of what uh, people are coming to us, and and so this is like let's our, our urban renewal uh, laws that Jenny uh, is familiar with. Uh, allows us to be aggressive on blight. Uh, we would define blight, and then we would uh, make laws to deal with blight. For example, um, you know, rehab your property, get your property rented, or you owe us a thousand dollars a month. Um, uh, tear your property down, or we're going to take it from you. Uh, tear your property down, or we're going to a thousand dollars a month. I'm next, next item. All right, next item. Uh, uh, this was just, this one was here, Planning Commission uh, for Waterfront Development Architectural Standards. I went through the standards that we did have, and I thought that in the event we have residential development coming in on the waterfront, that we that that the residential standards that we or the the architectural standards that we do have in place for the waterfront is attuned to more mixed use. Type, uh, you know, uh, business below, living on top, and so I think if we were to, if somebody were to say, "Hey, look, I'd like to build, you know, two hundred condos or a couple of apartment buildings," um, I think we should have some economic standards that are a little more applicable to residential development. Um, so that was the discussion point on that one. <laughs> Yeah, that's for. Well, these are architectural. We can all get our teeth into yeah. them. We'll yeah. start with that. Yeah. One. Because these other ones, we're going to have some discussion on that. All right, we'll just table those and build the architectural standards, and then we'll then come back around. And we'll put them back. Unless you want to you vote on. Well, yeah, we got HP 31015. We're going to be hammered. Yeah. That's a big one. You know, that's going to end in July. Then, you know, maybe. Bring some of this stuff up then and chip away at the architect. I mean, I, I I'm not wed to any one of these. I just brought them up. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done in the architectural one. I, mean, I think that's that's a good one to get going on. Yeah. And I don't think we have any public next meeting. Um, we do have an architectural review so far. Yeah, that's a trend. So I think we'll have a little time next meeting to talk about scope. So if we can all come with you know, some ideas, was there a motion to take that on? Well, you know, I mean, we take on um, uh, the idea and the concept of what architectural standards we want to develop. A second on that. Second. Aye. All, all favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So, and then we'll just table, table the rest for some other time. Mr. Wintowski, I'll take that up next. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so, you guys have any more information items? Yeah, um, you all should have received an email from Lisa Scholl with the Code of Ethics Handbook. 
Um, print there's printed ones. You want to print it? Does anyone else need a printed? I'll copy? sign it before. If I just print it, I'll sign it. Code. Oh, you just need the form signed. Yeah, I'm just going to sign it. Anybody else need a docu sign? Or there you have it done. I read it. I, I can sign it or I can come in tomorrow and sign it, whatever it's most. So how many people need a hard copy? I need a hard copy. I do. Jenny, when does it have to be in? Uh, she had a deadline 20th. in the email. The 20th. Uh, the 20th of January. Okay. Yeah, I've printed mine out and I've got it signed. I, I don't fly back into Oregon until Saturday. You can, you can scan it in if you have a scanner. Okay. Yeah, I do. Okay, great. I can't from this. I still have trouble with this thing every year. Electronically, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, sorry about the late hour, but um, we're adjourned. <laughs> yeah, just just in there. Very happy, Dan. I am going to thank you for